pays at last for Swiss multinational company Sika. French rival Saint-Gobain has ended its bid for control in return for a payoff. On the living markets, we explore what this means for the bar-based chemical group going forward. We're embracing all things fantasy in the big picture tonight. Basel is hosting Switzerland's largest convention for fans of film, comics and dressing up as movie characters. And we'll bring you all the colour and action. Our newsmaker tonight is creating a super fast pod that will enable people to commute at the speed of a plane. He's Dirk Alborn, CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies and has his set his sights on Abu Dhabi for its first commercial line. We will start out with a 10 kilometer line that later on um, should be connected to a larger network. That's together with uh, Aldar, a big uh, real estate company that, that has the land there. So it's everything's really exciting and we're moving forward quite well. A very warm welcome. You're watching the Swiss Polls. I'm Amanda King. This is The Living Markets. Let's catch up with international news and we start in Switzerland because one of the biggest takeover fights in Europe is winding to a close after more than three years. Seeker unveiled a complex deal today to end a long Swiss dispute. Under the deal, the heirs behind Seeker have sold their state to St. Gaban, which will surrender the special voting rights that were at the heart of the conflict with other Sika shareholders and management. Swiss chemicals manufacturer Sika, in turn, bought a nearly 7% holding from saint Gobain, a French supplier of building materials. Sika plans to establish a new unitary share class. The resolution is considered quite positive for Sika, which surged in trading today. We'll have much more on this story later in the programme. On Serene, some unexpectedly strong demand, Polyphor announced today that they will narrow the price range and upsize their upcoming IPO. The price range will now be between 35 and 38 francs per share, as opposed to the previously reported 30 to 40 francs per share. Polyphor is aiming for proceeds of up to 165 million Swiss francs and says it expects that trading in the shares will start on the 15th of May. Watch out, Basel world. There's a new fair in town, the Gem Geneve, held at the Palexpo Convention Centre in Geneva, was created in response to what was felt to be an unwelcoming environment for gem dealers and smaller family-owned companies at Basel world. So far, the show has received a favourable response, with 135 exhibitors already signed up and a waiting list of 35. This is more than the number of gem exhibitors at Basel world this year. The Gem Genève opened on Thursday and is open to the general public until May 13th. Mass anti-US protests flooded the streets of Iran after Friday prayers. That came just a few days after US President Trump announced his decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. On the streets of Tehran, the anger was directed at both Trump and Israel. Israel claimed it destroyed most of Iran's capabilities in Syria Thursday in response to an Iranian missile attack on the Golan Heights. Iran has not acknowledged that Iranian military presence in Syria was impacted by the Israeli strikes. The stage is set for a sit-down between US President Trump and the leader of North Korea. The summit next month could have tremendous implications for the region and the world. CNN's Natasha Chen has more from Washington. Any update it's official. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will meet in what will be a historic face-to-face -face meeting. The president announced the details of the summit Thursday morning, tweeting, the highly anticipated meeting between Kim Jong-un and myself will take place in Singapore on June 12th. We will both try to make it a very special moment for world peace. That gives the White House a little more than a month to prepare for delicate talks with the rogue leader, with the ultimate goal of full denuclearization. The announcement comes just hours after President Trump greeted three U.S. prisoners at Joint Base Andrews who were released by North Korea Wednesday. 
My proudest achievement will be, this is a part of it, but will be when we denuclearize that entire peninsula. This is what people have been waiting for for a long time. The president also drew criticism for praising Kim for his treatment of the U.S. prisoners, some of whom were sent to hard labor camps. Speaker Paul Ryan says the president deserves some latitude. So I think we all should give the, the president some leeway on preparing for this summit. And, to do, and by the way, it was a good faith gesture. A spokesman for the South Korean government says the country welcomes the U.S.-North Korean talks. South Korea's president, Moon Jae-in, will be in Washington on May 22nd to meet with Trump ahead of his sit-down with Kim. Moon met with Kim last month when the two leaders pledged to denuclearize the region and end the Korean War. Don't go away. A lot still to come on the financial markets, including that seeker deal. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. and the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Sunday in Europe. And discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. Markets. I'm Amanda King. Let's take a look at how the markets fed today. Well, it's a mixed picture. Markets in the US still trading, strong corporate earnings and oil prices are higher, but the overall sentiment lower in Europe. However, markets were mostly down today and uh, mixed picture also in Asia there. But back at home, the Swiss blue chip index SMI wrapped up the day slightly up but it was one company that attracted much attention on the markets in Switzerland today, and that was Sika. saint gobain a French building materials company, dropped its bid to control the chemicals group based in Zug. The agreement, revealed today, puts an end to a takeover battle which lasted more than three years. Sika shareholders, which also include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, were thrilled with the happy outcome. And as you can see here, Sika's share price today soared rather nicely. And not the only ones cheering. If we take a look at San Gaban's share price, it was up as well. So what's the deal all about, really? Well, let's break it down a little. With the new deal, San Gaban acquires a stake of 3.2 billion francs, becoming Sika's main shareholder. The stake previously belonged to the Burkhardt family who are the heirs to Sika founder Caspar Finkler. The French company, however, will sell 7% of that stake back to Sika, Sika will pay saint Gobain about 2 billion francs to cover the cost of the shares. Thanks to the deal, saint Gobain makes a profit of 710 million francs and for the next two years at least will collect the benefits from its stakes in Sika. As for the voting rights, which were at the heart of the dispute, Sika will hold an extraordinary meeting in June to merge both its shares on the Swiss Stock Exchange. Finally, saint Gobain won't have a seat on the Sika board, they also said they won't make any takeover bid for the next six years. Earlier, senior report Andreas Schaffner talked to Sika chairman Paul Helg. Helg was opposed to the deal from the very start, more than three years ago. It was quite busy, quite stressful, especially in the beginning uh, when the transaction was announced, or the planned transaction, uh, better said. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, over the whole three and a half years we could stay together as a board and uh, that today we could announce the solution to this uh, long story. 
at the end, what really made people change their mind to have this solution? I think there are two things. One is that the value of the Sika store uh, stock is now above the value of the contract uh, price, is one point. And the second is the timing. Uh, it became uh, clear that uh, before the contract between family and uh, Saint Gobain ends, there will not be uh, a decision, a final decision of the federal court. And I think those two points brought uh, the other parties to the table. What about the possible defeat in front of court? Was it also an argument? Uh, no, the, the, it, I think it's clear that the court decision uh, wouldn't matter anymore uh, because there is never, it will not be a final decision within the contract period. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's not relevant. So who made the first step then? Uh, it was from uh, Sangoma where we were uh, contacted. We always had uh, contacts um, before, but uh, it became then uh, uh, more intense uh, after the uh, General Assembly. What about the one share, one vote decision? This is something which a lot of companies still don't have in Switzerland. Will you be a role model for them? Uh, we don't particularly want to be a role model. We want to introduce a modern uh, governance uh, structure. Uh, we've, we did fight uh, for, uh, for this uh, in the interest of SICA and of all uh, shareholders. And at the next uh, EGM, we will introduce one share, one vote. We will eliminate the opting out. Uh, we will eliminate the voting right uh, restrictions. And we will also split the stock uh, by a factor of 60 to make it more uh, tradable all in the interest uh, of our shareholders. The stock price went up pretty clearly today at Sika, but also at Sangoba. What's your explanation? Uh, you know, it was always a lot of uncertainty uh, uh, on our stock on, on uh, Sika uh, because there was no uh, resolution to this transaction. It was not clear where it would end. And uh, I'm pleased that the market uh, supports us uh, in our decision. and. Uh, as uh, a board member, uh, I think I can speak for all board members, we are very pleased with, with the outcome of the negotiations and with this transaction. We could achieve all the targets we always uh, wanted and uh, obviously it's now good that the market does see it the same way. What about going on and looking in the future? You have two years maybe which uh, saint wouldn't wouldn't sell their shares. Is it a bit of uncertainty still ahead? Uh, not the contracts control uh, very much what uh, Sangoban can do and, uh, and limit them uh, in what they can add as participation in Zika and also they have always to contact, contact us first uh, in case they want to sell. Uh, so it's a pure financial investment uh, for them and uh, I could well see that uh, after the two years lockup uh, we would start to discuss what to do with the 10%. What about Sangoba having a, a member of the board also on their side? Is this a discussion? Uh, it was a discussion, but that's uh, absolutely excluded. Uh, and uh, because Sangoba and Sika, we are competitors, and uh, it cannot be that the competitor has a seat in our board, and that was accepted by Sangoba. This was at the beginning also your argument to uh, being against this deal, wasn't it? Exactly, and it's finally recognized by saint that they are a competitor. What about your salary? You didn't get any salary being a chairman of the board in the last few years. Will this happen now? Uh, we have on every uh, General Assembly, we have the agenda point uh, compensation. We'll put it in again on the next uh, uh, extraordinary General Assembly. There is no reason now uh, to vote against, uh, family did vote against, uh, to tire us out and, uh, and there is no reason anymore for that, so I'm convinced we will get the salaries accepted. So joining me live in the studio to talk about what all of this means for the future of Seeker is Dan Scott, Deputy CIO at Von Tobel. Now Dan, um
Uh, Dan, just a, a quick uh, technical problem there. I apologise for that. Now, this Seeker deal, that was positive for everyone involved, really? I mean, it looks like it, doesn't it? If you view the market reaction, we have Seeker shares trading higher. In Paris, you also have Saint-Gobain trading higher. Uh, clearly, it was a deal that no one liked. Neither shareholders of Saint-Gobain nor shareholders of Sika um, really were all that interested. And so, in the end, you have a very positive reaction, but also because of the way that uh, it didn't happen uh, and the fact that they've now decided to stand alone. So Sika remains independent, we know that. Now, the voting rights of these shareholders, that was the essence of this dispute. And it went on for, like, three years. And um, voting rights and shareholders not having equal rights when it comes to voting, is that normal when it comes to companies and shareholders? Well, I mean, it's a... Uh, it's, uh... Uh, a leftover that we have from the past and from a corporate governance perspective it's something that we don't like to see. Um, no one likes to see themselves being treated differently from, say, a founding family that has, uh, you know, higher controlling, um, even though they have less of the shares. So, in the end, it's up to a shareholder, and if you decided to buy Sika shares, you should have been aware that the normal shares didn't have the same voting rights as the Winkler family's uh, um, shares. But on the other hand, from a corporate governance perspective, in the end, we don't think this benefits anyone. So the one share, one vote regime, is that what really we're looking for is the ideal scenario in all companies and shareholders. Well, it's been necessary to un untangle the mess here in order for all the parties, for Saint-Gobain, for the family, and, um, and for management, the boards of Sika, to agree. And in the end, it was something that really was positive for everyone. So um, I think even the ones who had to take the price on the chin, Saint-Gobain, in the end, even their shareholders were happy that this mess is now untangled. And you watch the companies quite closely. Any other sort of uh, companies out there that might be, uh, you know, having unfair, you know, voting rights when it comes to the shareholders. Well, there's there's quite a few, obviously. Um, I mean, Switzerland, it's it's there's there's more than just one company here. There's quite of the big caps on the SMI do have dual shareholder structures, and um, and it's something though that over the years, successively, one after the other, tries to phase out. And it really comes from the family legacy. So when the founding family has these rights and then sells their stake on, that's where the mess begins? Very often is the case. And even in, in the new economy, this is not necessarily just a European problem. Facebook, for example, is a similar situation where Zuckerberg actually has many more voting rights than he actually has shares in the company. So Zuckerberg actually controls Facebook, but, um, but has a, a controlling minority in shares. Now, when it comes to the construction sector generally, globally speaking, we know that uh, Sika and Sankovan aren't going to become one big power, but what does it mean for the rest of the sector? How is it faring? Well, I mean, the sector has been trying to consolidate because they had an issue with margins. And Sika, um, our analyst is Baron Pomran. He has a buy on the stock and he's quite positive on the outlook for Sika. Um, if you take a look at what Jan Jenisch, the former CEO, did at Sika, he managed a very strong turnaround. We have margins that are in the double digit range, EBITDA margins of 15%. Earnings growth expected for 2018 also in the double digit range. And it's part of the reason why Sika trades on high multiples. It's trading on about 25 times forward PE. So it's a high quality company with strong margins and good growth. So part of the reason why it was initially a takeover target of Saint Gobain. And now that we have a single shareholder structure with no main shareholder, um, it again opens up the possibility that a large competitor could come and make a takeover. So it's not out of the question yet. OK, great. Now, Dan, stay where you are, because I've got lots more to ask you on the economy, on markets. But first, I just want to take a short break to have a look at the uh, foreign exchange rates with, uh, with Swiss Quote. Thanks.
still with me here on the Living Markets is CIO, Deputy CIO at Von Tobel, Dan Scott. We'll be having a quick chat. Well, Dan, thanks for staying with me. Um, now, Q1, uh, we've seen the earnings season is now behind us. Uh, any sort of just general overview in Switzerland and US? It seems tech companies did well. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the one major takeaway, the big headline, if I had to you know, say it in one or two words, would be best earnings season ever. Oh, wow. That's it, a bold statement. It's... Um, so does that mean we should be sticking with those as stocks? I mean, we're seeing good employment, inflation, better wages perhaps in the US. So stick to stocks? Well, in fact, yes. Um, it, although getting specific about the selection is increasingly important. So in general, we had about an 80% beat in the first quarter. Pretty much all of the S&P 500 have reported. Most of the companies in Switzerland also have reported. The beats for the first quarter were strong. Um, when you take a look at the outlook, you can see, though, that some of the companies are now talking about a bit of a rolling over or a slowing down in the growth um, outlook for the rest of the year. And I think that's where the volatility started to set in. You saw it for consumer staples. Some of them were talking about input costs rising. And at the same time, they weren't able to pass on that rising input cost to consumers. So consumer staples didn't perform very well, even though the numbers were good. Industrials also, we had some wobbles in the industrial sectors. Companies like Caterpillar talking about potentially that was it. That was as good as it gets. Um, and the share is selling off on the back of that. When it comes to emerging markets, though, we're seeing a lot of outflows. So does that mm. mean invest in developed markets? Well, I mean, on the emerging markets situation, we think no. We think that the outflows that we saw in emerging markets purely were because we had a short period um, where we thought inflation was picking up a little bit, yields rose about 3%, and you basically had money being sucked out of emerging markets and parked back again in the US because long-term yields in the US were back above 3%. We maintain our overweight emerging markets because we think structurally they're stronger, demand is strong, the earnings outlook is better, companies are less indebted in emerging markets. So we take that volatility um, on boards and we enjoy the extra yield that you get from emerging market corporate debt. OK, being a bit of a contrarian there. Now, those yields that you mentioned, they're not... Uh doing any damage to equities at the moment? No, I think at these levels, not. I mean, if we head much above 3%, then, then yes, uh, there will have to be some, some rotation. But we don't necessarily see much potential beyond 3% in, uh, in US Treasuries. So from that perspective, um, we think that equities really still are far more attractive than bonds. And of course, much of all of this does stem from uh, dollar strength. Uh, has it taken a pause for a while? What's your assessment there? Yeah, I mean, we structurally, we're negative on the dollar. So we think that it has longer term. It's on its way down. And what happened now was just a bit of a recovery. It was technically, on a short-term basis, it was oversold. We had a bit of a spike higher, helped by geopolitical political risks um, and other factors, but, uh, but now you see that it's, that's already unwinding again and the dollar is back to its declining trends. So we definitely are sticking with emerging markets and think investors have much more opportunity there. Now, I'll come to the wider problem of the US sanctions on Iran in just a moment, but Russia is threatening to dump US dollars in favour of euros. Is this going to be a, a trend we see globally, do you think? I, I mean, I think increasingly there are more countries that are putting on a fight with the US in the trade negotiations debates by saying, we're not going to use your currency as a reserve currency. So that's an option that's open to China when they're arguing with the US that they're no longer going to trade in US dollars with their international counterparts. Or for the Iranians to say, well, I don't need to sell your oil in, or our oil in US dollars. We can sell it in blockchain or we can sell it in uh, Chinese yuan. Um, and these are ways, of course, that, um, that they go into the negotiations with the US. But this could be a huge destabilizing movement couldn't it? I think probably not, because um, it, it still represents Chinese yuan and, uh, of course, the Iranian uh, currency represent very small amounts. Uh, um, if, to, to move to the euro, perhaps, but short to medium term, we don't really see the US dollar being destabilized as the global currency. OK, so let's talk about this U-turn. Uh, uh, Trump has... Uh, is imposing, reimposing sanctions on Iran. And mm -hmm. uh, now the markets seem to be ready for that. Would you say that's fair? They barely wobbled. It's true. Yeah, they barely wobbled. We're lucky um, because it could have gone another way. I think the big, uh, the big part of it was the reaction of Iran itself to say that they are actually staying in the agreement. They first want to meet with their European counterparts, Russia and China. 
um, before that they, you know, move forward and make any decisions. And so it really depends on the rest of the countries within that initial agreement um, whether it gets unraveled or not. Um, and, and of course, the one potential area that still could flare up in this situation is Israel and how they um, chime in with this current situation. Um, but, uh, but the way things have unraveled so far, it seems like we have a peaceful so resolution. So markets absorbed it fairly well, but when it comes to oil prices, mm -hmm. it really took center stage there, I suppose. Uh, longer term, do you see any supply risks? So we think Iran is a sentiment driver for oil. It doesn't really have any impact on the real underlying fundamentals. We're talking about maybe 200,000 barrels a day of production that would be uh, sapped out of the markets. We're not really talking about big movers to the fundamentals. The fundamentals driving the oil price at the moment are the fact that big oil majors have underinvested over the past five years, so there's not enough production to meet the current demand out of emerging markets predominantly, which remains strong. So demand for oil continues to rise every year, one to two percent, but production isn't keeping up. Are you of the camp then that uh, barrels will be a hundred dollars? So day? we're definitely not that high up, but we think that they're supported around the current price level. We think that if oil prices go too high up too quickly, what you're going to get is a response from shale and from other areas that can quickly turn on reserves. Shale is very quick. They can overnight increase their production if the price is right. Uh, deep sea is very different. Deep sea takes six years from investment decision to actual production. So um, deep sea, which is the biggest amount, we're talking about 70% of the total production, um, that is slow. But shale, which represents about 15% of production, is fast and it can respond. And just maybe one last word on volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, trade wars... What, what are your expectations over the next weeks and months? Well, so we actually think the volatility, volatility right now has come back to low levels again is too low, and it likely will pick up again like we saw at other parts in the first quarter. So volatility, we think, is, should be back to normalized levels like we saw in the first quarter um, and, um, or, or over the first quarter, and that's why we think that active management and selection is very important at this point. Lovely, Dan. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you, Amanda. Well, we're going to go to some sports news now, and Switzerland wants to make a splash on the international sporting calendar. The country is hoping to host the 2020 Acrobatic Gymnastics World Championships. And here with more on that uh, is our sports correspondent, Matt Layton. Now, Matt, uh, what are Switzerland's chances of hosting this acrobatics event? Very high, I would say, mainly on the basis that no-one else wants to. Now, what might happen is there's going to be a decision maybe this July on who is going to host the prestigious Acrobatics World Championships. What are acrobatics? Well, it's involving teams of two, three or four people who go on a mat, a classic mat, in front of a jury. They do a four-minute performance or two-minute performance rather and they're based on their positioning their acrobaticness and the general moving they're going to do now in switzerland it's a small sport eight clubs 200 members a history that goes back maybe 50 60 years but we've been speaking to caesar salvadori now he is mr acrobatic gymnastics in switzerland daniela the wife and him have been at it for the last 30 years the formula is this when i was speaking to caesar yesterday at a very important championships in geneva he was telling me what has to happen is three steps the first one he has to get the town the city of geneva to agree with the project he feels they are agreeing they've actually booked the vernay ice rink from the 1st to the 17th of May, 2020, in order to hold this event. Sounds the second costly. thing they have... Well, it is, yes. I'll go into that in a second. The second thing they have to do is go to the canton, and the third thing they have to do is go to the Swiss Confederation. He feels they have the argument to do it. Costly, it all depends, doesn't it? The budget is going to be about 2 million Swiss francs. He feels that up to 45% of that is going to have to come from public contributions. And here, what they've done already is they've done a very fine film saying, this is where we are, this is all the lovely landmarks, and this is what we can put on for Geneva. Costly with the two million, there'd be about 1,300 athletes coming in. It would be the second world championships since 1995. 
where they had the climbing world championships. But he believes he's got the right people. He believes that it's going to be a great event. And equally importantly, he's going to try and put it on free of charge to the public. So Cesar Salvadori is looking to really do the most amazing thing. Well, the shows look like they've got potential to be phenomenal, these teams of two. How does acrobatics really differ from gymnastics? Do they really go together, Matt? Yes and no. The Gymnastics Federation, according to Caesar, they are traditional, they are massively successful in Switzerland, and they drain all the resources i.e. they take all the money from the Swiss Olympic. Say so there's trampolining, there's traditional uh, acrobatics that we see on the telly in the Olympics. There's also rhythmical with the music. But he feels that they don't like him. They say, well, this is the new kid in the block. The best way to understand what sort of athletes they are is you go to Cirque du Soleil or one of those big performances. Most of those come from Russia and they come from China, which is the world champions, the best at acrobatic Olympics. So he, gymnastics rather, he's feeling that they're so good that if they actually manage to muscle in, everyone else is going to lose a bit of money. So he says they don't really like them and they want them to go away. But this year, they're hoping to, uh, they're actually going to go to the Youth Olympic Games in Argentina. It's going to be the mixed pair demonstration. And Caesar and his mates feel it's going to really take off from there. There's lots of teams, international teams, flying in from all over the world to Geneva this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. What's going on there? It's the 17th Acro. And it's been going for a couple of days. It's also going to go on tomorrow in the Bois de Frey, if you know where that is. It's a big, big sports centre. This competition, we've seen some images from last year here, it's got some United States, some from Wales and some from England and some from France and Germany. And it is all the, the top athletes in Europe putting on displays. It's well worth going to. The sport receives absolutely no subsidies, whatever. But as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, it may have the possibility of bringing the world championship to swim to Geneva, in fact. Switzerland decides, but Geneva would be nominated, and a decision's likely to be made in July this year. So, so a lot more people might get involved. The essence of the sport is you use your bodies to throw each other and to balance each other in, in very beautiful positions. I'm seeing lots of children, uh, Matt. How young can you start competing? Five years old. Competitions, they are 11 to 16. 12 to 19, and then the seniors, which is above 15 years old. The idea is junior on your juniors, you have quite a large uh, age difference. And that's because the people lifting, clearly their muscles are going to be stronger than the people actually lifted. So they say it's a safe sport. It's something that's good for the family, good for the body, doesn't cost anything, and you can have a lot of fun. Lovely. Thank you very much, Matt. Speak to you soon. Now, plenty of countries and regions are known for their beer, but perhaps Tibet, Tibet, I should say, isn't one of those that springs to mind. That could all be about to change. Find out more after the break. Hello there. Now, he's Swiss Tibetan, a beer master, and also a member of the Communist Party of China. Sonny Gelzer is founder and chairman of Shangri-La Beer. He's also convinced that China is about to witness a craft beer revolution. But his mission stretches beyond just making beer. He also aims to build a sustainable business that helps local farmers and businesses and create jobs for children from his mother's orphanage. Sonny, both uh, your parents are from the highlands of Tibet, but you were born and raised here in Switzerland. Tell me about the start of your business idea to produce beer in China. So, yes, thank you for hosting me here. And uh, uh, like you said, it's true. I'm born and raised in Switzerland, but uh, my roots are from Tibet. And uh, I started my business here, uh, my real estate business with 25. And I built it up with my two partners, with my brother, Garden Gyaltsur, and my best friend, Philip Kirchley. But, uh, you know, I was busy building up my business. And with 32, I had the feeling that 
life is passing by and I wanted to have a change. And uh, it was more or less from one day to the other that I decided to, to break up my tent and go for a round the world trip. And I did that for one year and two months. And I ended up in, in China, in Tibet. And I visited my mom there because she's running already more than 25 years an orphanage. So I had the chance to visit the orphanage and I was really deeply impressed by the work of my mom, what she did for the kids. And uh, I had a lot of discussions with her and I wanted to know how she wants to move on with the orphanage. And she said, you know, actually you can help me because the orphanage runs smooth. But she has problems. She was worried about the kids who are coming out of the orphanage and they had sometimes a hard time to find good jobs because uh, in our society, in the Tibetan culture, uh, it's a little bit the job of the parents and the relatives to find jobs for their kids, right? And these kids from the orphanage, they didn't have this network. So my mom was worried that they, they, they don't find or they can't find good jobs. And she asked me if I can help them because in my company in Switzerland, I had already interns, I trained interns. So she knew that I had this experience. And she asked me and I said like, well, what should I do? And she said like, you know, maybe a good idea. Tourism is very big. International hotel chains are coming to Shangri-La. And uh, if you can train our kids and they would be valuable employees for, for these hotels. I said like, that sounds actually quite interesting. And uh, I thought like, maybe I can do that for a season, for six, seven months. So we rented, uh, all, in old town of Shangri-La, we rented a, a small restaurant and I took the first six, seven kids and I started training them uh, a little bit management skills, bookkeeping, cooking, etc., etc. And uh, yeah, that was actually the starting point of our business because I love to drink beer. And this is in Shangri-La city, which is located in the southern Chinese province of Yunnan, bordering Tibet. How was it for you to rediscover your roots there? Uh, that was uh, very interesting. I mean, it was a culture shock, uh, a shock on, on, on different levels. Yeah, on one side, uh, it was a culture shock. On the other side, it was a, a business shock also. It was different for me because you're born here, you're raised here in Switzerland, and then you're coming back. And the only thing which connected me to the local people was that I, I looked like that, you know. So, but it was hard for me to speak the local Tibetan language. They have a different dialect, and even Chinese was really hard to understand. So, uh, the beginning was definitely hard, but interesting on the, on the, on the, same, on the same moment. You founded your beer business, Shangri-La Beer, in 2009. How difficult or easy was it to start up with uh, this business? Uh, definitely in China, everything is difficult, right? So everybody knows if you want to do something, they handle things differently. So uh, yes, for, for us, the same thing. The reason why, in the beginning, we had like a small microbrewery. We didn't have, even have the idea to, to have a big brewery, right? So we, I wanted to have a local product. and. Uh, and I had this microbrewery and I wanted to build, I wanted to brew with, with the local ingredients. One thing, the water in Shangri-La is very good. Second, we have a special kind of grain. We call it Tibetan Highland barley. So with these two things in a fusion to make a local product, that was my goal. But short after we started uh, selling our beer in our restaurant, the local government came to us and said like, it's not allowed for you to bottle beer and sell beer because we have policies, we have laws, and, uh, and uh, you have to require, you have to acquire all the licenses. But we are interested that you are building a bigger brewery because you are using the local uh, barley and, we are, and you're buying that from the local farmers and th that is supporting the local uh, environment and the local society, the local business. So we are very interested that you're growing your business uh, in, in, uh, in Shangri-La with, with your beer, and we will support you, so. You're also a Communist Party member and a board member of the China Craft Beer Association, somewhat uh, contradictory, and on top of that, you're Tibetan. How does that work together, and how do you need to be part of these official, you know, Chinese organizations or uh, Communist Party to run a business there? Yes, I mean, it's a very interesting question. If you would ask me, if you would say like 10 years back that I would be a member of the Chinese Communist Party, I would laugh, right? It was so far away but I take this uh, this uh, this uh, membership very serious because for me uh, I'm in Shangri-La I'm uh, my roots are from Shangri-La and I have a chance through this 
uh, associations that I can influence the development of Shangri-La because my view uh, to Shangri-La is different than the local people because I come, I'm coming with a Western mindset. So that's why I take this uh, very serious one side. The other side to become a, a leader in the China Craft Beer Association, definitely Shangri-La Highland Craft Brewery is a leading uh, brewery when it comes to craft beer in China. And uh, we are on the upfront and definitely I can feel that we are standing in front of a craft beer revolution in China and we can see that even from, uh, from, the, from the growth numbers we are growing double, uh, double digits, right? So I want to influence that too, I want to be part of this historic event. Let's talk about the Chinese and the Swiss beer industries. So um, how is the taste of you know, your beer, Shangri-La beer from Tibet different from the Swiss beers? So, yeah, I mean, beer, in the, in the end of the day, beer is beer, right? So we have four ingredients to make beer, but uh, especially for when I'm talking about Shangla beer, what is different is definitely we are brewing our beer on 3,300 meters over sea level. So it's very high altitude and the water boils at 92 degree. So our system, the whole brew system, brew process is different. We are, we are brewing uh, everything under pressure. It's like a rice cooker system. So we get the temperatures up to 108 degrees. This is very important. But when I'm talking about Shangla beer, what is Shangla beer and how I would describe it, I describe it always with as a, as a beautiful Tibetan girl, you know? So our- How is that? Our, our Tibetan girl has a very beautiful body, okay? So we have to create uh, our Shangla beer body also. So we are using uh, very special malls uh, from Belgium, uh, like crystal malls, color malls, etc. We are using our Highland Ball and we are performing this body mm -hmm. out so of this mall. Very soft or strong? I will have to try afterwards. You have to try it later. And I, I, I don't want to say it right now. I want, I want to hear you what you're saying. Yeah? Great. Then uh, we have the body. Our Tibetan girl uh, has a blood, blood runs through her veins, right? We are not using blood. We are using the Shangri-La water. So the Shangri-La water, when it comes out of the ground, is already 100 years in the ground. So we are using mineral water, the best water maybe in China, to brew our beer. Then our Tibetan girl has a strong character. So we are creating this character with different kind of yeast strains. So we have bottom fermenting yeast, we have top fermenting yeast. So with this, we are, we are creating our character of our beer. And our Tibetan girl has a, a very nice and gentle soul. So for our beers, the soul part, we are using different kind of hops. We're using bitter hops to balance our beers, and we are using aroma hops to give different kind of flavors, like fruity flavors, like citrus flavors, etc., etc. And in the end of the day, when we are brewing our beer, we are very, very dedicated. And especially after drinking one bottle, I'm sure that your soul is very beautiful as well. <laughs> so yeah. your beer is also called Made in Heaven because it is produced above uh, 3,300 meters above uh, sea level. How long does this production process take approximately? Uh, it depends. It depends on what kind of, uh, what style of beer we are brewing. So we have the freedom that we are, as a craft brewery, that we are not bound to, let's say, to the German purity law or something like that. So we are creating new types of beer. We are creating lagers, we are creating ales, IPAs, etc., etc. There are 200 different styles of beers, right? So uh, it depends. Normally, let's say in general, when we are producing our beer and fermenting our beer, it takes normally around 25 days until it's in a bottle. But some of our special beers, which we are aging in, in oak uh, uh, cask, can be to one year, right? So, yeah. Shangri-La beer is one of the biggest independent breweries in China, but you are facing a lot of fierce competition from the big beer makers in China, such as Tsingtao beer, Yanxing beer, and also Snow beer. How do you face this competition? I mean, yes, beer competition in China is definitely very fierce. Uh, but I wouldn't say that Shangri-La beer has to compete with Tsingtao and Yanxing beer because these are like the big industrial breweries. We, I see that always like in three layers. Let's say like we have on the bottom, we have the stomach layer. So in the stomach layer, you have beers which are just commodities. Industrial breweries making mass volume, low quality, low alcohol, it's just and cheap, right? We don't have to compete with them. Then on the hard level here, we have 
brands which are, have uh, emotional appealing. Let's say a, a computer would be like Samsung, right? And in this field, you have the international companies which are brewing the beer in China, like Budweiser and Carlsberg. We don't compete with them also. Then for us, the open wild field is, uh, is the top part, the head part. So the head part is, uh, is, is our market and uh, our consumers, we call them the apple, apple consumers. So what is an apple? An apple is a guy in China who can afford an iPhone. Why he's buying an iPhone is because he wants to show that he's uh, sophisticated, he's different, he's interested in the world. Most of them can speak even English, right? So uh, this is our target customer. Shangri-La beer craft beer should be on the top part, and we, we want to attract uh, these kind of, uh, of people. Let's talk about your different uh, beer types here. So you have about six uh, in the line right now. There are, for example, the Tibetan uh, Pale Ale, there is Black Yak, Supernova, etc. cetera. Um, how are they different in taste? Uh, so we are here in the uh, bottled, yes, we have six, six SQs and, um, and craft beer is something uh, like a new term in China still, right? So we have to educate the people about beer because like I said, they are used to drink like the light lagers, exactly. So we are starting with the Yala, so which is a, a light, light beer, uh, won by the way, won already an international award at the Brussels Beer Challenge and uh, it's brewed with, with Highland Barley, but this is an uh, entry beer, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have Songa as a good German beer, good German lager. Then we have here uh, the Black Yak, which uh, won the silver medal as the first Chinese brewery at the European Beer Star. It's a dark lager. Then here we have the Fat Droma, which is a double wheat bock, very strong, very uh, sweet in taste. We have the Tibetan Pale Ale, which goes more into hoppy beers, like a pale ale, IPA ale style, it's more like a session IPA ale. And then for the real like craft lovers, we have the Supernova, which is a full moon beer. We are brewing that only at full moon and we are spicing it up with local herbs and, and spices. Yeah. In which uh, markets are you currently selling your beers and uh, where are you planning to expand in the future? Um, right now, our focus or so our strategy is that we want to we wanna become the number one craft beer in the west of China. That means especially the Tibetan areas with Tibetan Autonomous Region, Qinghai, part of Sichuan and part of Yunnan, because we want to be an authentic Tibetan beer, so Tibetan people should drink it. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, definitely we think that our branding is strong enough that we can go internationally. And my, my vision or my dream in future is that we are that we are producing a Tibetan product brewed or made by Tibetan people which goes worldwide or around the world. That is my, my dream. Mm -hmm. So you've also inked a deal with Feldschlösschen, which is Switzerland's biggest uh, beer brewery. Tell me about it. So yeah, I mean, definitely we have the link to Switzerland also, uh, and uh, and uh, Feldschlösschen is uh, one of the market leaders. I think the market leader in, in Switzerland. It's for us an honor to work with Feldschlösschen together. Feldschlösschen has a house of brands, so they are they are selling beers brands which are not even brewed by Feldschlösschen. So the house of brands, so everybody can experience different kind of beers, and we are honored that we can sell or uh, we can start selling our beers in this house of brands. In, in cooperation with Feldschlösschen. You're active in the real estate sector, you're also doing humanitarian work. Um, what's next for you? So yeah, definitely I'm focusing right now on, on, on our beer business. It should be a little bit like um, my vision. And the vision, especially for Tibetan people in, 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 in the autonomous region and in, in, in China in general, because I want that they are becoming more self-confident, that they are starting their own businesses, and I want to be a role model for them also, right? So this is my, this is my idea that to one side to make business, which is not really like short, short-term thinking, it's long-term thinking, on the other side, on the way to support and help the, the, the community. So this is, this is my goal. Well, as we head into the weekend, we've got all the latest from the world of entertainment coming up for you in the next hour. That's it from the Living Markets. I'll be back at 8 p.m. with the newsmakers, so don't go away.
CNN Money Switzerland weather, we start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. We are embracing all things fantasy in the big picture. Basel is hosting Switzerland's largest convention for fans of film, comics, and dressing up in character. And we'll bring you all the color and action. And our newsmaker tonight is creating a super fast pod that will enable people to commute at the speed of a plane. He is Dirk Alborn, CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and has set his sights on Abu Dhabi for their first commercial flight. We will start out with a 10 kilometer line that later on um, should be connected to a larger network. That's together with uh, Aldar, a big uh, real estate company that, that has the land there. So it's, everything is really exciting and we're moving forward quite well. A very warm welcome. You're watching The Big Picture. I'm Ana Maria Montero. Let's get it started. the big picture and these are the news that are making headlines here in Switzerland and around the world. One of the biggest takeover fights in Europe is winding to a close after more than three years. Sika unveiled a complex deal today to end a long Swiss dispute. Under the deal, the heirs behind Sika have sold their stake to San Giovan, which will surrender the special voting rights that were at the heart of the conflict with other Sika shareholders and management. Swiss chemicals manufacturer maker Sika, in turn, bought a nearly 7% holding from saint Giovann, a French supplier of building materials. Now, Sika plans to establish a new unitary share class. The resolution is considered quite positive for Sika, which surged in trading today. And answering some unexpectedly strong demand, Polyfor announced today that they will narrow the price range and upsize their upcoming IPO. The price range will now be between 35 and 38 francs per share, as opposed to the previously reported 30 to 40 francs per share. Polyfor is aiming for a total gross in proceeds of up to 165 million Swiss francs and says it expects that trading in the shares will start on the 15th of May. Watch out, Basel World. There's a new fair in town. The Gem Genève, held at the Palais Expo Convention Center in Geneva, was created in response to what was felt to be an unwelcoming environment for gem dealers and smaller family-owned companies at Basel World. So far, the show has received a favorable response, with 135 exhibitors already signed up and a waiting list of 35. This is more than the number of gem exhibitors at Basel World this year. 
The Gem Genève opened on Thursday and is open to the general public until the 13th of May. And mass anti-U.S. protests flooded the streets of Iran after Friday prayers. That came just a few days after U.S. President Donald Trump announced his decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. On the streets of Tehran, the anger was directed at both Trump and Israel. Israel claimed it destroyed most of Iran's capabilities in Syria Thursday in response to an Iranian missile attack on the Golan Heights. Iran has not acknowledged that Iranian military presence in Syria was impacted by the Israeli strikes. And the stage is set for a sit-down between U.S. President Trump and the leader of North Korea. The summit next month could have tremendous implications for the region and the world. CNN's Natasha Chen has more from Washington. Any update? It's official. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will meet in what will be a historic face-to-face -face meeting. The president announced the details of the summit Thursday morning, tweeting, the highly anticipated meeting between Kim Jong-un and myself will take place in Singapore on June 12th. We will both try to make it a very special moment for world peace. That gives the White House a little more than a month to prepare for delicate talks with the rogue leader, with the ultimate goal of full denuclearization. The announcement comes just hours after President Trump greeted three U.S. prisoners at Joint Base Andrews who were released by North Korea Wednesday. My proudest achievement will be, this is a part of it, but will be when we denuclearize that entire peninsula. This is what people have been waiting for for a long time. The president also drew criticism for praising Kim for his treatment of the U.S. prisoners, some of whom were sent to hard labor camps. Speaker Paul Ryan says the president deserves some latitude. So I think we all should give the, the president some leeway on preparing for this summit. And, to do, and by the way, it was a good faith gesture. A spokesman for the South Korean government says the country welcomes the U.S.-North Korean talks. South Korea's president, Moon Jae-in, will be in Washington on May 22nd to meet with Trump ahead of his sit-down with Kim. Moon met with Kim last month when the two leaders pledged to denuclearize the region and end the Korean War. Coming up, Basel has been getting in touch with its fantasy side this week. That's because it's hosting the Swiss Comic Con, which goes on until tomorrow. Now, I was at Messe Basel to check it all out. And you can see my report, which also includes your latest entertainment news in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland Leisure Weather Report. Here's our Swiss webcam view of the day. Let's begin with the Outdoor Activity Comfort Index for the western part of Switzerland. And now for the eastern part. And on to the south of Switzerland. Now, let's have a look at the weather forecast for the north of Switzerland. And for the west. Let's take a look at the rain forecast for Europe. And here's a snapshot of the weather on the Mediterranean Sea. As well as the water temperatures. CNN Money Switzerland wishes you a great time outdoors. where the city is embracing all things fantasy. <laughs> That's right, we're talking the Swiss Comic Con and we're here, we're gonna bring you all the action. Also coming up, the Cannes Film Festival opens in the Côte d'Azur. Melissa McCarthy goes back to school in her new movie and we're gonna bring you the film premiere that was out of this world. Welcome, I'm Ana Maria Montero. Let's get started. Have a nice day. Welcome to Fantasy Basel. This is the fourth edition, think San Diego Comic Con, but in Switzerland. And basically it's a convention where people gather to celebrate their favorite characters and stories 
from the fantasy genre, of course, in film, TV, comics, and gaming. And when you talk about successful fantasy genre franchises, especially in the last few years, you must talk Game of Thrones, the wildly successful series by HBO. And joining me now, of course, are two former cast members of this wildly successful show, Game of Thrones. Welcome, guys. Hi. Hi, thank you. Thanks I'm, for having us. I'm Ian Biddy. This is Toby Sebastian. I, I mean, the first question I got to ask you is, what were your characters on Game of Thrones? I was Tristan Martell, and you were? Sir Meryn Trant. All right, so... The King's Guard. So we have been, you've been off for what, one season or two? Uh, I've been off since the end of season five. I exited rather spectacularly at the end of season five. And I was in season five for a few episodes and then season six for one episode before I was brutally murdered. Terrible. But once Game of Thrones, always Game of Thrones, right? Oh, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a role that has absolutely changed my life in every which way for the better. I get to travel the world. I get to come to yeah. beautiful places like Basel and meet some absolutely wonderful people. As you can see, the atmosphere here is fantastic. Everybody's having a wonderful time. And you get young kids, people of all ages dressing up. It's just been brilliant. Yeah, it's, got, it's almost like a bonus, right, of being a character like this, is then you get to relive it <laughs> all over the world. I mean, it's, Thrones is epic, so it's going to be one of those things that goes. We were talking about it last night, actually, how even when the show finishes in a year's time, these things are going to be going on for a long old time for all sorts of movie franchises, and Thrones is going to be very, very important, even more important, because it's history, you know? It's like nothing has ever been this big on this scale, TV-wise, anyway. Well, tell me what it's like for you guys to be at events like this, where people are only want to know about these characters and you... It's lovely because you have people actually for the first time ever, you I mean, loads of people are Game of Thrones fans, but people that come here and come and talk to you are diehard Game of Thrones fans. So they know as much as we, and they, mean, they know more than I do. They know more things about the story and more of the names and characters than I do, and that's really lovely. And how does Switzerland compare to other of these uh, Comic-Con events that you've been to around the world? Well, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I would say that it does have a common theme and a common thread that I have found in all Comic-Cons. The type of people that come here are huge fans, for example, who come and meet us, huge fans of the show. And I love that. I love their passion. And I love, because I'm a huge fan of the show. But one thing all the Comic-Cons I've ever been to have in common are the people. They are here to have a good time. I have never seen ever wants any trouble at any comic con i've ever been at they're here to have a wonderful time it's a wonderfully safe environment for families to come to everybody gets dressed up do you guys have still have your costumes speaking of costumes i wish i did you get to, did you get to keep yours no of course they didn't they're keeping them for a gallery or for those costumes will be worth a fortune one day it's funny, I, I saw my costume because I opened the Game of Thrones touring exhibition in Barcelona uh, last October, and I believe it's coming to Paris next, as far as I know. And my actual costume is one of the display costumes. Really? So I'm thinking of stealing it. <laughs> All right, so if we catch you at next year's Comic-Con wearing your costume, we'll know you stole it. Ian, thank you Absolutely. so much for being with us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Switching now from television to film news, the Cannes Film Festival 71st edition kicked off this week in the Côte d'Azur. Sans Netflix and Sans selfies on the red carpet, two new things this year. But however, the Quasette did glitter with its usual glamour. This includes jury president Kate Blanchett, Julian Moore, Benicio del Toro, Martin Scorsese, Penelope Cruz, and Javier Bardem. Now, the Spanish couple starred in this year's competition opener, Everybody Knows, the latest film by Oscar-winning Iranian director Askar Faradi. The Spanish-language movie was picked up for distribution by Focus Features the second day. And also in competition are two Swiss co-productions, Happy as Lazaro, a film by Alice Rohracher, and Jean-Luc Godard's Livre d'Image. In addition, Switzerland participated in Pope Francis, A Man of His Word by Wim Wenders, which will be shown in the special screenings program. The Cannes Film Festival wraps up the 19th of May. Now, also in film news, when this actress is not impersonating Sean Spicer, the Hollywood star is working very hard on camera as well as behind it. She is a writer, she's a comedian, she's a mother and a fashion designer. Now in her latest film, she plays a mother that goes back to school and Rick Damagella in Hollywood has the story. 
Let me see you. I don't regret staying at home and being your mom, but I regret not getting my degree. That's why somebody's mom just enrolled in college. Beep, 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 it's me. Melissa McCarthy is the matron who goes back to matriculate in Life of the Party. Get ready for the wild ride. I think those dads just checked you out. We're just looking at my smock. It tends to catch the light. The collegiate comeback commences after her character's unexpected divorce, but it was McCarthy's real-world husband, director Ben Falcone, who saw the comedic potential. Ben really had the initial idea of, you know, what if a mom went back to school with her daughter, and he grew up in a college town, so that whole college world is very near and dear to him. We got free tiger lanyards, everybody! Oh! I really love the idea of showing a woman who liked her life, mm. had a great relationship with her daughter. It kind of all gets shaken up, and she wasn't unhappy in her life, but now realizes she, she can, and it's okay to want something else and want a little more. Of course, there are challenges to directing your wife in a scene where she makes out with a college student. That was my anniversary, so we were, you know, I'm yelling at him, hey, th that's great, um, you know, so maybe uh, could you touch his butt, Mooch? And she's like, okay. Don't jump to conclusions. You don't know what's happening here. It looks like my mother is doing the walk of shame out of a frat house. Well, okay, I guess technically that's what's happening. Let's just go. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. All right, we're going to get back here to Comic-Con, and I'm joined by one of the top cosplayers in Europe. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Ben, but otherwise known as? More cosplay. Yeah. All right, tell me about your character. The character is Garrett from The Witcher. Usually everybody knows him. <laughs> <laughs> Me excluded. <laughs> if you are a gamer or if you are from Poland, then you know him because it's one of the, uh, well, how can I say? Everybody in Poland knows The Witcher, everybody, because uh, it's coming from Poland. Okay. Uh, it's been, uh, there was a lot of books. Okay. Uh, this is a Polish author and everybody knows it. Every, really, everybody. When I walk uh, on the streets like this, people are screaming, uh, cars stopping by and say, oh, the Witcher, the Witcher. So if you're a gamer or from Poland, you know this character. All right, now everybody else does too. Everybody watching, now we all know who you are. Thank you for that. Tell me about this costume in terms of, it's obviously very elaborate. It's very detailed. You put a lot of time into it. Uh, what's the investment here? What are we talking? In terms of, money oh i i don't know actually i don't know it was um we built this costume in six weeks with uh, four people my wife and me we have a company and we built costumes and props for the gaming industry so in this case we posted uh, a makeup test of garrett a picture of me and then immediately cd project red which is the gaming company from the witcher uh sent me an email and yeah from this moment on they hired me as their official garrett all over the world so we had to make the costume in six weeks because there was a deadline for the first event. So it was a lot of work, but I can't tell you how much it is because I have no clue. So. But this has become a job for you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a so-called professional cosplayer, but we also have the company, and we had the company before I was a professional cosplayer. And could you make a living as a cosplayer then? Yeah, it's, it's uh, somehow difficult uh, when, you are, when you stick to the copyright law, then it's difficult. That's what I always work with the companies uh, with the companies, when, when I, I'm the witcher, uh, I sold a calendar, for example, uh, a witcher calendar, and then I talked to CD Projekt about this. That's a difficult part uh, of this. If you want to, to be on the legal side all the time, it's difficult because usually the companies say no. So, but yeah, they say, no, don't sell anything. But I work a lot with, uh, a lot with CD Projekt, and in this case, they say, of course, you can sell the calendar. But you should always ask. So it's not easy, but... Yeah, if you don't, let's say, if you don't mind, you can just do it. And there are a lot of people, they, they can live. Uh, you can make a living. Yeah. You can make a living. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's possible. Usually you travel a lot, around a lot. You are a cosplay guest at conventions. And you can live with that. But and you, you get you, appearance fees and things like that. Of course, of course. But the difficult part is what I told you about the copyright thing. And so that's tricky. So you have to be careful. Yeah. All right, so where? how does... Um, Fantasy Basel compared to other Actually, conventions you've been at? Because I've seen the hotel so far, the airport, and my booth. Okay. That's it. But usually it is like that. I travel a lot. I see, I see the whole world, but I always see airport, hotel, booth. So 
I didn't have time to see anything so of the convention. Maybe, no, not tomorrow. Tomorrow I have to leave very early. Maybe this evening, when it closes, I can walk around for 15 minutes. We would see. <laughs> All right, between now and then, I'm sure you'll be taking a lot of photos as mall. Well. Of course, yeah. Enjoy it. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and yeah, see you next time. When it comes to fantasy, an event like this just would not be the same without these guys. And for those Star Wars fans out there, we've got a treat for you. The Hollywood premiere of Solo, A Star Wars Story. She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts. The iconic Millennium Falcon landed on Hollywood Boulevard for the world premiere of Solo, A Star Wars Story. Alden Ehrenreich plays a younger version of Solo. Well, I think you're meeting Han at a different time in his life, and I think part of the fun of the movie is getting to watch him become this guy, learn these hard lessons, and go from sort of more of an idealist to someone who, you know, who you'll see. <laughs> the event featured both men who've worn the cape of gambler and scoundrel Lando Calrissian. I'm a very big Star Wars fan, like, I, and, and I don't say this lightly, it's like, I think it is satisfying because you get to see how a lot of things came to be, and it's not, what I think I like about this film the most is like, it is gritty. Well, I'm curious to see what uh, Donald does. He's a wonderful young man. He's an extraordinarily talented young man. So it'll be interesting to see what he, uh, what he brings to uh, uh, good old Lando. <laughs> and the man beneath the fur of Chewbacca. We'll uh, show Han and Chewie how they met each other. And uh, it's going to be a fun film. Even if it wasn't a Star Wars film, it would be... Uh, a very spontaneous adventure film, one that blows you away with its surprises and twists. Cast members playing characters new to the Star Wars universe use the Force to keep their on-screen secrets. Well, I can tell you that she's pretty mysterious, but she's pretty badass. I play the bad guy, which is really nice. I was, um, I was also filming uh, Avengers Infinity War, so I was going from playing somebody who was, you know, fundamentally just a good guy to playing somebody who was sort of fundamentally uh, a deliciously bad guy, and it was, it was a lot of fun. I get referred to as a mean man, which is unfair, because my guy's not mean. He just wants things straight, that's all. Yeah, come on! From a galaxy far, far away, I'm Rick Damagella. And that is it for us here at Fantasy Basel 2018. Thank you so much for being with us. I am Ana Maria Montero, and until next time. All right, but it's not it for us here tonight on The Big Picture. Still much more to come, including the first person to sail nonstop solo around the world. Don't want to miss it. All right, welcome back to The Big Picture. Of the nine entrants in the first ever solo nonstop around the world sailing race, one finished, six retired, one was rescued, and one disappeared, believed to have committed suicide. British merchant seaman Robin Knox Johnston, the only man to finish the grueling madcap Golden Globe race in April 1969, wrote his name into sailing's history books as the first person to sail nonstop solo around the world. Robin, when you set off, how possible did it all seem? I mean, the thing was, no one knew if it was possible. Um, I remember a chap coming up to me in cows when I had the boat out at Suitors saying, are you this Johnny who thinks he's going to sail single-handed non-stop around the world? And I said, well, I'm going to try. He said, well, it can't be done. In any case, you can do it. I'd sailed through Haiti non-stop from Cape Town to London in 77 days with my brother and a friend. So I had an idea of the sort of quantity of things I'd want. I knew what it was like to be at sea for a long period of time, because that was a long voyage in those days. You need to be stubborn and very, very set on it. I was totally set on it. I mean, I'd made my mind up to go. Did I know if it was possible? No. Um, 
I just felt I was as qualified as anyone. What did you miss the most? I think I missed the human contact, being, not being able to discuss things with someone. You know, I, I just have to sit there and have a conversation with myself. It's actually quite hard to argue with yourself, uh, but it, you know, I took to learning poetry just to keep my mind active, because I realized at my age, when I got back, I've got to get a job again. When you look back on it, what, what were the scariest moments? Anyone who says they're not scared at sea is a liar. Um, you're bound to be scared at times. You know, when you're looking astern and you see a 70, 80 foot wave breaking at the top, stretching from horizon to horizon, don't tell me you're not a bit scared. And you see it coming towards the boat and you realize you can be swept off. You've got to do something or I won't be here. Um, I might get back to the boat, but probably won't. I mean, I went up the rigging to get away from that one. But when the boat's being smashed by the waves, you realize, you know, she won't take this much longer. That's frightening. When you arrived back into Falmouth and, and you'd done it and you knew that you were the first person to sail solo around the planet, you know, what was that moment like? How did you feel? I always think I was lucky. I mean, I was there at the right moment. Um, I was there and sufficiently experienced at the right moment. And I saw the opportunity and grabbed it. I think that applies to life, doesn't it? I mean, we all get opportunities. How many of us take them? And how often does it not work out, you know, for people? I was lucky it worked out. It would, may, maybe it wouldn't have done, in which case my life would have been very different. How much easier, Robin, do you think this edition will be than 50 years ago? You know, I think this race is going to be harder in some respects and easier in others. It's going to be easier because they know it's possible. Uh, they can use freeze-dried food and, and the things that we've developed in the last 50 years. But I think it's going to be harder for them because they're not so used to doing without as I was. You know, they're, they're going to feel more deprived because we have a higher standard of living now. I think that's going to be tough for some of them. Former CNN producer Kelly Pollock and her husband gave up their jobs to sail the seven seas, but their trip wasn't all sunshine in paradise. Oh, that didn't sound good. Oh, what the... Oh, sh... Just assume that everything breaks. What? What is wrong with this thing? It is so unbelievable to think we're finally doing this after all the planning we've put in. Um, it's exciting, it's also really scary. So, situation update. <laughs> Stranded in the English Channel because of this rope and caught round the propeller. Solent Coast Guard is en route. We're officially under tow here. It's very good. <laughs> Galley style. I'm <laughs> So, we've just had the worst night's sleep. And it's because um, there's a huge amount of swell. And the boat is just going back and forwards and throwing you from one end to the other. It's going to be a moonless night, so it could be pretty dark. So we'll have our eyes on the EIS to see, uh, make sure that we're not running into anything. I'm on watch. I've been on watch for half an hour and disaster's already struck. We've been for a swim to untangle another bit of rope underneath the hull. I don't know whether this is a common feature, but it's happened to us twice now in the last three weeks. What? What? It just cut out? Oh my god. What is going on? Doing all this stuff for the first time is really tricky when you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what to expect, you don't know what your boat is capable of, even though it's brand new. Uh, there seem to be problems that we're dealing with. So at the moment, we're both feeling pretty low. 
but then you know the sun comes up and it's spectacular and you fall back in love with the boat again. Maybe this is just it for the first six months. All right, staying with sports now, Switzerland wants to make a splash on the international sporting calendar. The country is hoping to host the 2020 Acrobatic Gymnastics World Championships. Amanda Kane has been finding out more from our sports correspondent, Matt Layton. Now, Matt, uh, what are Switzerland's chances of hosting this acrobatics event? Very high, I would say, mainly on the basis that no one else wants to. Now, what might happen is there's going to be a decision maybe this July on who is going to host the prestigious acrobatics world championships. What are acrobatics? Well, it's involving teams of two, three or four people who go on a mat, a classic mat, in front of a jury. They do a four-minute performance, or two-minute performance, rather, and they're based on their positioning, their acrobaticness, and the general moving they're going to do. Now, in Switzerland, it's a small sport, eight clubs, 200 members, a history that goes back maybe 50, 60 years, but we've been speaking to Cesar Salvadori. Now, he is Mr. Acrobatic Gymnastics in Switzerland. Daniela, the wife, and him have been at it for the last 30 years. The formula is this. When I was speaking to Caesar yesterday at a very important championships in Geneva, he was telling me what has to happen is three steps. The first one, he has to get the town, the city of Geneva, to agree with the project. He feels they are agreeing. They've actually booked the Vernet Ice Rink from the 1st to the 17th of May, 2020, in order to hold this event. Sounds the second costly. thing they have... Well, it is, yes. I'll go into that in a second. The second thing they have to do is go to the canton, and the third thing they have to do is go to the Swiss Confederation. He feels they have the argument to do it. Costly, it all depends, doesn't it? The budget is going to be about 2 million Swiss francs. He feels that up to 45% of that is going to have to come from public contributions. And here, what they've done already is they've done a very fine film saying, this is where we are, this is all the lovely landmarks, and this is what we can put on for Geneva. Costly with the two million, there'd be about 1,300 athletes coming in. It would be the second world championships since 1995 where they had the climbing world championships. But he believes he's got the right people. He believes that it's going to be a great event. And equally importantly, he's going to try and put it on free of charge to the public. So Cesar Salvadori is looking to really do the most amazing thing. Well, the shows look like they've got potential to be phenomenal, these teams of two. How does acrobatics really differ from gymnastics? Do they really go together, Matt? Yes and no. The Gymnastics Federation, according to Caesar, they are traditional, they are massively successful in Switzerland, and they drain all the resources, i.e. they take all the money from the Swiss Olympic. So there's trampolining, there's traditional uh, acrobatics that we see on the telly in the Olympics. There's also rhythmical with the music. But he feels that they don't like him. They say, well, this is the new kid in the block. The best way to understand what sort of athletes they are is you go to Cirque du Soleil or one of those big performances. Most of those come from Russia and they come from China, which is the world champions, the best at acrobatic Olympics. So he, fe gymnastics rather, he's feeling that they're so good that if they actually manage to muscle in, everyone else is going to lose a bit of money. So he says they don't really like them and they want them to go away. But this year, they're hoping to... Uh, they're actually going to go to the Youth Olympic Games in Argentina. It's going to be the mixed pair demonstration. And Caesar and his mates feel it's going to really take off from there. There's lots of teams, international teams, flying in from all over the world to Geneva this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. What's going on there? It's the 17th Acro. 
and it's been going for a couple of days. It's also going to go on tomorrow in the Bois de Frey, if you know where that is. It's a big, big sports center. This competition, we've seen some images from last year here. It's got some United States, some from Wales and some from England and some from France and Germany. And it is all the, the top athletes in Europe putting on displays. It's well worth going to. The sport receives absolutely no subsidies, whatever. But as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, it may have the possibility of bringing the world championship to swim to Geneva, in fact. It's Switzerland decides, but Geneva would be nominated, and a decision like it made in July this year. So, so a lot more people might get involved. The essence of the sport is you use your bodies to throw each other and to balance each other in, in really beautiful positions. I'm seeing lots of children, uh, Matt. How young can you start competing? Five years old. Competitions, they are 11 to 16, 12 to 19, and then the seniors, which is above 15 years old. The idea is junior on your juniors, you have quite a large uh, age difference, and that's because the people lifting, clearly their muscles are going to be stronger than the people actually lifted. So they say it's a safe sport, it's something that's good for the family, good for the body, doesn't cost anything, and you can have a lot of fun. Plenty of countries and regions are known for their beer, but perhaps Tibet isn't one which immediately springs to mind. Well, that could all be about to change. Find out more after the break. He's Swiss Tibetan a beer master, and also a member of the Communist Party of China. Sonny Gyalsur is founder and chairman of Shangri-La Beer. And he's also convinced that China is about to witness a craft beer revolution. Sonny, both uh, your parents are from the highlands of Tibet, but you were born and raised here in Switzerland. Tell me about the start of your business idea to produce beer in China. So, yes, thank you for hosting me here. And uh, uh, like you said, it's true. I'm born and raised in Switzerland, but uh, my roots are from Tibet. And uh, I started my business here, uh, my real estate business with 25, and I built it up with my two partners, with my brother, Garden Gyaltsur, and my best friend, Philip Kirchli. But, uh, you know, I was busy building up my business, and with 32, I had the feeling that life is passing by, and I wanted to have a change. And uh, it was more or less from one day to the other that I decided to, to break up my tent and go for a round-the-world trip, and I did that for one year and two months, and I ended up in, in China, in Tibet, and I visited my mom there because she's running already more than 25 years an orphanage, so I had the chance to visit the orphanage, and I was really deeply impressed by the work of my mom, what she did for the kids, and uh, I had a lot of discussions with her, and I wanted to know how she wants to move on with the orphanage, and she said, you know, actually, you can help me, because the orphanage runs smooth, but she has problems. She was worried about the kids who are coming out of the orphanage, and they had sometimes a hard time to find good jobs because uh, in our society, in the Tibetan culture, uh, it's a little bit the job of the parents and the relatives to find jobs for their kids, right? And these kids from the orphanage, they didn't have this network. So my mom was worried that they, they, they don't find or they can't find good jobs, and she asked me if I can help them, because in my company in Switzerland, I had already interns, I trained interns, so she knew that I had this experience, and she asked me, and I said, like, well, what should I do? And she said, like, you know, maybe a good idea Tourism is very big. International hotel chains are coming to Shangri-La. And uh, if you can train our kids, and they would be valuable employees for, for these hotels. I said, like, that sounds actually quite interesting. And uh, I thought, like, uh, maybe I can do that for a season, for six, seven months. So we rented, uh, all, in old town of Shangri-La, we rented a, a small restaurant. And I took the first six, seven kids, and I started training them. Uh, a little bit management skills, bookkeeping, cooking, etc., etc. And uh, yeah, that was actually the starting point of our business because I love to drink beer. 
And this is in Shangri-La City, which is located in the southern Chinese province of Yunnan, exactly. bordering Tibet. How was it for you to rediscover your roots there? Uh, that was uh, very interesting. I mean, it was a culture shock. Uh, uh, shocks on, on, on different levels. Yeah, on one side, uh, it was a culture shock. On the other side, it was a, a business shock also. It was different for me because you're born here, you're raised here in Switzerland, and then you're coming back. And the only thing which connected me to the local people was that I, I looked like them. <laughs> You know, so, but it was hard for me to speak the local Tibetan language. They have a different dialect and even Chinese was really hard to understand. So uh, the beginning was definitely hard, but interesting on the, on the, on the, same, on the same moment. You founded your beer business, Shangri-La Beer, in 2009. How difficult or easy was it to start up with uh, this business? Uh, definitely in China everything is difficult, right? So everybody knows if you want to do something, they handle things differently. So uh, yes, for, for us the same thing. The reason why in the beginning we had like a small microbrewery, we didn't have, even have the idea to, to have a big brewery, right? So we, I wanted to have a local product and, uh, and I had this microbrewery and I wanted to build, I wanted to brew with, with the local ingredients. One thing, the water in Shangri-La is very good. Second, we have a special kind of grain. We call it Tibetan Highland barley. So with these two things in a fusion to make a local product, that was my goal. But short after we started uh, selling our beer in our restaurant, the local government came to us and said like, it's not allowed for you to bottle beer and sell beer because we have policies, we have laws, and, uh, and uh, you, have to require, you have to acquire all the licenses. But we are interested that you are building a bigger brewery because you are using the local uh, barley and, we are, and you're buying that from the local farmers and that is supporting the local uh, environment and the local society, the local business. So we are very interested that you are growing your business uh, in, in, uh, in Shangri-La with, with your beer and we will support you. So. You're also a Communist Party member and a board member of the China Craft Beer Association. Somewhat uh, contradictory and on top of that you're Tibetan. How does that work together and how do you need to be part of these official you know, Chinese organizations or uh, Communist Party to run a business there? Yes, I mean it's a very interesting question. If you would ask me, if you would say like 10 years back that I would be a member of the Chinese Communist Party, I would laugh, right? It was so far away but I take this uh, this uh, this uh, membership very serious because for me uh, I'm in Shangri-La uh, my roots are from Shangri-La and I have a chance through these uh, associations that I can influence the development of Shangri-La because my view uh, to Shangri-La is different than the local people because I come I'm coming with a Western mindset so that's why I take this uh, very serious one side the other side to become a uh, uh, a leader in the China Craft Beer Association, definitely. Shangri-La Highland Craft Brewery is a leading uh, brewery when it comes to craft beer in China. And uh, we are on the upfront and uh, definitely I can feel that we are standing in front of a craft beer revolution in China. And we can see that even from, uh, from, the, from the growth numbers, we are growing double, uh, double digits, right? So I want to influence that too. I want to be part of this historic event. Let's talk about the Chinese and the Swiss beer industries. So um, how is the taste of, you know, your beer, Shangri-La beer from Tibet different from the Swiss beers? So, yeah, I mean, beer, in the, in the end of the day, beer is beer, right? So we have four ingredients to make beer. But uh, especially for when I'm talking about Shangri-La beer, what is different is definitely we are brewing our beer on 3,300 meters over sea level. So it's very high altitude and the water boils at 92 degrees. So our system, the whole brew system, brew process is different. We are, we are brewing uh, everything under pressure. It's like a rice cooker system. So we get the temperatures up to 108 degrees. This is very important. But when I'm talking about Shangri-La beer, what is Shangri-La beer and how I would describe it, I describe it always with as a, as a beautiful Tibetan girl. You know, so our, how is that? Our, our Tibetan girl has a very beautiful body. Okay, so we have to create uh, our Shangri-La beer body also. So we are using uh, very special malls uh, from Belgium, uh, like crystal malls, color malls, etc. We are using our Highland Ball and we are performing this body. Mm -hmm. 
out so of this mold. Very soft or strong? I will have to try afterwards. You have to try it later. And I, I don't want to say it right now. I want, I want to hear you what you're saying. Uh, Great. Then uh, we have the body. Our Tibetan girl uh, has a blood, blood runs through her veins, right? We are not using blood. We are using the Shangla water. So the Shangla water, when it comes out of the ground, is already 100 years in the ground. So we are using mineral water, the best water maybe in China, to brew our beer. Then our Tibetan girl has a strong character. So we are creating this character with different kind of yeast strains. So we have bottom fermenting yeast, we have top fermenting yeast. So with this, we are, we are creating our character of our beer. And our Tibetan girl has a, a very nice and gentle soul. So for our beers, the soul part, we are using different kind of hops. We are using bitter hops to balance our beers and we are using aroma hops to give different kind of flavors like fruity flavors, like citrus flavors, etc, etc. And in the end of the day, when we are brewing our beer, we are very, very dedicated. And especially after drinking one bottle, I'm sure that your soul is very beautiful as well. <laughs> so yeah. your beer is also called Made in Heaven because it is produced above uh, 3,300 meters yes. above uh, sea level. How long does this production process take approximately? Uh, it depends. It depends on what kind of, uh, what style of beer we are brewing. So we have the freedom that we are, as a craft brewery, that we are not bound to, let's say, to the German purity law or something like that. So we are creating new types of beer. We are creating lagers, we are creating ales, IPLs, etc., etc. There are 200 different styles of beers, right? So uh, it depends. Normally, let's say in general, when we are producing our beer and fermenting our beer, it takes normally around 25 days until it's in a bottle. But some of our special beers, which we are aging in, in oak uh, uh, cask, can be to one year, right? So, yeah. Shangri-La Beer is one of the biggest independent breweries in China, but you are facing a lot of fierce competition from the big beer makers in China, such as Tsingtao Beer, Yanxing Beer, and also Snow Beer. How do you face this competition? I mean, yes, beer competition in China is definitely very fierce. Uh, but I wouldn't say that Shangri-La Beer has to compete with Tsingtao and Yanxing Beer because these are like the big industrial breweries. We, I see that always like in three layers. Let's say like we have on the bottom, we have the stomach layer. So in the stomach layer, you have beers which are just commodities. Industrial breweries making mass volume, low quality, low alcohol, it's just and cheap, right? We don't have to compete with them. Then on the heart level here, we have brands which are, have an emotional appealing. Let's say a, a computer would be like Samsung, right? And in this field, you have the international companies which are brewing the beer in China, like Budweiser and Carlsberg. We don't compete with them also. Then for us, the open wild field is, uh, is the top part, the head part. So the head part is, uh, is, is our market and uh, our consumers, we call them the apple. Apple consumer. So what is an apple? An apple is a guy in China who can afford an iPhone. Why he's buying an iPhone is because he wants to show that he's uh, sophisticated, he's different, he's interested in the world. Most of them can speak even English, right? So uh, this is our target customer. Shangla beer, craft beer should be on the top part, and we, we want to attract uh, these kind of, uh, of people. Let's talk about your different uh, beer types here. So you have about six uh, in the line right now. There are, for example, the Tibetan uh, Pale Ale, there is Black Yak, Supernova, etc. cetera. Um, how are they different in taste? Uh, so we are here in the bottled, yes, we have six, six SQs and, um, and craft beer is something like a new term in China still, right? So we have to educate the people about beer because like I said, they are used to drink like the light lagers, exactly. So we are starting with the Yala, so which is a, a light, light beer, uh, one by the way, one already an international award at the Brussels Beer Challenge and uh, it's brewed with, with Highland Barley, but this is a entry beer, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have Songa as a good German beer, good German lager. Then we have here uh, the Black Yak, which uh, won the silver medal as the first Chinese brewery at the European Beer Star. It's a dark lager. Then here we have the Fat Droma, which is a double wheat bock, very strong, very uh, sweet in taste. 
We have the Tibetan pale ale, which goes more into hoppy beers, like a pale ale, IPA ale style. It's more like a session IPA ale. And then for the real like, craft lovers, we have the Supernova, which is a full moon beer. We are brewing that only at full moon, and we are spicing it up with local herbs and, and spices. Yeah. In which uh, markets are you currently selling your beers, and uh, where are you planning to expand in the future? Um, right now, our focus or so our strategy is that we wanna we wanna become the number one craft beer in west of China. That means especially the Tibetan areas, with Tibetan Autonomous Region, Qinghai part of Sichuan and part of Yunnan, because we want to be an authentic Tibetan beer, so Tibetan people should drink it. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, definitely we think that our branding is strong enough that we can go internationally. And my, my vision or my dream in future is that we, are, that we are producing a Tibetan product brewed or made by Tibetan people, which goes worldwide or around the world. That is my, my dream. Mm -hmm. So you've also inked a deal with Feldschlösschen, which is Switzerland's biggest uh, beer brewery. Tell me about it. So yeah, I mean, definitely we have the link to Switzerland also. Uh, and uh, and uh, Feldschlösschen is uh, one of the market leaders, I think the market leader in, in Switzerland. It's for us an honor to work with Feldschlösschen together. Feldschlösschen has a house of brands, so they are, they are selling beers, brands, which are not even brewed by Feldschlössen. So the house of brands, so everybody can experience different kind of beers. And we are honored that we can sell or uh, we can start selling our beers in this house of brands in, in cooperation with Feldschlössen. You're active in the real estate sector. You're also doing humanitarian work. Um, what's next for you? So yeah, definitely I'm focusing right now on, on, on our beer business. It should be a little bit like um, my vision. And the vision, especially for Tibetan people in, 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 in the autonomous region and in, in, in China in general, because I want that they are becoming more self-confident, that they are starting their own businesses, and I want to be a role model for them also, right? So this is my, this is my idea that to one side to make business, which is not really like short, short-term thinking, it's long-term thinking, on the other side, on the way to support and help the, the, the community. So this is, this is my goal. And that is it for us here tonight on The Big Picture. Coming up next is the newsmaker. Remember, if you forgot or missed or would simply like to rewatch something, you can catch it all at cnnmoney.ch. I am Ana Maria Montero. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. Our newsmaker tonight is creating a super fast pod that will enable people to commute at the speed of a plane. He's Dirk Alborn, CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and has set his sights on Abu Dhabi for the first commercial line. We will start out with a 10 kilometer line that later on um, should be connected to a larger network. That's together with uh, Aldar, a big uh, real estate company that, that has the land there. So it's Everything is really exciting and we're moving forward quite well. Peace at last for Swiss multinational company Sika. French rival St. Gaban has ended its takeover bid in return for a payoff. We explore what this will mean for the bar-based group going forward. Good evening, I'm Amanda Kane. You're watching The Newsmaker here on The Swiss Pulse.
Let's catch, catch up with some international news and we start in Switzerland because one of the biggest takeover fights in Europe is winding to a close after more than three years. Seeker unveiled a complex deal today to end a long Swiss dispute. Under the deal, the heirs behind Seeker have sold their stake to San Goban, which will surrender the special voting rights that were the heart of the conflict with other Seeker shareholders and management. Swiss chemicals manufacturer Seeker in turn bought a nearly 7% holding from Saint Gabin, a French supplier of building materials. Seeker plans to establish a new unitary share class. The resolution is considered quite positive for Seeker, which surged in trading today. And we'll have more on that story later in the programme. Answering some unexpectedly strong demand, Polyfor announced today that they will narrow the price range and upsize their upcoming IPO. The price range will now be between 35 and 38 francs per share, as opposed to the previously reported 30 to 40 francs per share. Polyfor is aiming for proceeds of up to 165 million Swiss francs and says it expects that trading in the shares will start on the 15th of May. Watch out, Basel World. There's a new fair in town. The Gem Genève, held at the Palexpo Convention Centre in Geneva, was created in response to what was felt to be an unwelcoming environment for gem dealers and smaller family owned companies at Basel World. So far, the show has received a favourable response with 135 exhibitors already signed up and a waiting list of 35. This is more than the number of gem exhibitors at Basel World this year. The Gem Genève opened on Thursday and is open to the general public until May 13th. Mass anti-US protests flooded the streets of Iran after Friday prayers. That came just a few days after US President Trump announced his decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. On the streets of Tehran, the anger was directed at both Trump and Israel. Israel claimed it destroyed most of Iran's capabilities in Syria Thursday in response to an Iranian missile attack on the Golan Heights. Iran has not acknowledged that Iranian military presence in Syria was impacted by the Israeli strikes. And the stage is set for a sit-down between US President Trump and the leader of North Korea. The summit next month could have tremendous implications for the region and the world. CNN's Natasha Chen has more from Washington. Any update on it's official. American President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will meet in what will be a historic face-to-face -face meeting. The president announced the details of the summit Thursday morning, tweeting, the highly anticipated meeting between Kim Jong-un and myself will take place in Singapore on June 12th. We will both try to make it a very special moment for world peace. That gives the White House a little more than a month to prepare for delicate talks with the rogue leader, with the ultimate goal of full denuclearization. The announcement comes just hours after President Trump greeted three U.S. prisoners at Joint Base Andrews who were released by North Korea Wednesday. My proudest achievement will be, this is a part of it, but will be when we denuclearize that entire peninsula. This is what people have been waiting for for a long time. The president also drew criticism for praising Kim for his treatment of the U.S. prisoners, some of whom were sent to hard labor camps. Speaker Paul Ryan says the president deserves some latitude. So I think we all should give the, the president some leeway on preparing for this summit. And, to do, and by the way, it was a good faith gesture. A spokesman for the South Korean government says the country welcomes the U.S.-North Korean talks. South Korea's president, Moon Jae-in, will be in Washington on May 22nd to meet with Trump ahead of his sit-down with Kim. Moon met with Kim last month when the two leaders pledged to denuclearize the region and end the Korean War. Coming up after the break, we find out how one day we might all be heading to work in pods that can travel as fast as airplanes. That's the hope of our newsmaker tonight. But before projects like Hyperloop become a reality, there's plenty of red tape to get through first. More on that in a moment. Don't go away. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. the comfort indexes for some cities.
Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. And we end with Sunday in Europe. and discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. Imagine your daily commute involving sitting in a pod which is propelled through a vacuum tube using a magnet, and which can reach the speed of an airplane. That's the vision of our newsmaker tonight, who's the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Dirk Albon says the California-based company is moving ahead with the technology and commercialisation of the product at fast speed. The first track is about to be opened, but it will probably be another three years before the service is up and running. Regulatory requirements are among the obstacles to be tackled. Dirk Albon spoke with Martina Fuchs during the St Gallen Symposium to get the latest on the technology's developments. Dirk, thank you so much for joining us. You said at the start of 2018 that the uh, first location for a track of Hyperloop will be announced at some point this year and that also the first passenger pod will be ready by this summer. Can you give us an update? Yeah, so we had actually a pretty, um, pretty busy year. We just started construction of our R&D center in Toulouse. Um, uh, I don't know if you've seen the footage, but the big tubes arrived and uh, we're getting ready now to build two tracks there. Um, right after that, we announced um, um, the location of the first commercial line, which uh, will be in the Emirates in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we will start out with a 10 kilometer line that later on um, should be connected to a larger network. That's together with uh, Aldar, a big uh, real estate company that, that has the land there. So it's Everything is really exciting and we're moving forward quite well. The capsule has been um, put into production last year already. So it's being manufactured by Kaburis, which um, uh, is a supplier for Airbus and Boeing. They are manufacturing airplane fuselages. So it's basically almost the same as a Hyperloop capsule. And um, the capsule will be ready around July. Um, then it will come to Toulouse for assembly and integration into the system. It will be optimized in, on the track in Toulouse before then going into the first commercial system. You also said that the first passengers could use the system within just three years. Is this not uh, still too ambitious? Well, you know, we are working already on um, all the safety regulations. We have been working with our partner Munich Re on uh, the insuring concept, they actually said last year that they're able to, they're going to be able to insure the system. So, um, you know, of course, regulations might not be ready by then, so you still might have to sign a waiver to use it, but the system is going to be up and running, and um, you and me, you know, if you sign the waiver, will be on the Hyperloop. And by when do you expect commercial and public use, and in which regions and countries are you planning to roll out this transportation system first? So um, Abu Dhabi is now the first commercial line. Um, we are working with several governments around the world right now on different feasibility studies. The so feasibility study is always the first step, right? You need to answer certain questions that everybody has. How much is it going to cost to build? How much is it going to cost to operate? How many people are you going to be able to move? Where is it going to go along? How fast is it going to be? So all of these things are being answered in those feasibility studies. And of course, they are also the first step to talk about the regulatory framework. The regulatory framework is probably the biggest hurdle. So you need to create a completely new set of laws. It's not a train, it's not an airplane. And um, that's what's necessary in order to move into commercialization. So working with our partners, TUV, so TÜV and uh, Munich Re is very important in order to get to a commercial system. Talking about the political regulations and also political will, where does most of the resistance come from at this point? Actually, to be honest with you, we don't have much resistance. The, um, the issues that we're solving is not so much about speed. Speed is 
almost like a side effect of the technology because we're inside a low pressure environment, we can move much faster. Of course, in order to move fast, you have to go very straight. So it's very similar to a high speed rail alignment. But um, the, the real important part, the blue ocean, is um, that we're able to build a commercial system that makes economic sense. So there's no rail line, no metro line in the whole world that's profitable. Um, the Hyperloop, because it has very low operational costs, can be profitable in a very short time span. All the feasibility studies that we have done so far show return of investment between 8 to 12 years. And um, that's something that has never been seen so far in, you know, in a train or in a subway. Now it seems that the first track will be operational in Abu Dhabi by the year around 2020, as far as I can tell, and would connect the uh, cities of Abu Dhabi and Dubai as the first pilot project and then roll out in other countries in the Gulf? No, so actually it, Abu Dhabi, Dubai is not planned at this time. It's, uh, it's, in, the, it's in Abu Dhabi. It's the uh, first uh, part is a 10 kilometer track that later on will connect to a network inside the Emirates. Now the idea of a Hyperloop and super fast uh, transportation but basically comes from uh, the Tesla founder and tech billionaire Elon Musk. Uh, how is your relationship with Elon? So actually the idea is much older. So already in the 1800s there were the first attempts to build, um, you know, tube travel. The first patent for a train inside uh, a vacuum dates back to 1904. In uh, the US there were several attempts to build a system like that. Switzerland had a project called Swiss Metro, which was actually very similar to what we are doing today. It was underground tunnels, low pressure environment, large maglev trains. So it was just very expensive at that time. But um, it's not a new idea. So Elon was the one who proposed this idea and um, basically said, hey, we should do something better than what's out there today. Um, but when he said that he was too busy with Tesla and SpaceX, he also said that he wanted someone else to pick it up, and that's basically what we did. Um, he's not involved in what we're doing. Does he's, he still uh, have some kind of a say in the project, though? Um, well, he's not working with us, so we're completely independent. Uh, we're working in a very unique way. We have over 800 team members all around the world, 50 different companies and a very large community. Uh, Elon is working on the boring company, which is um, doing a new technology when it comes to boring tunnels, which is probably something very complementary to uh, what we are doing, as well as, uh, of course, a space of competition. So working with universities and, um, you know, getting all of those students from all around the world to concentrate and, uh, and building new technologies that are around the Hyperloop. So it's, you know, he's definitely supporting the community and the movement. Now, the Hyperloop project and concept basically uh, transports uh, passenger pods uh, through vacuum uh, tubes uh, using magnets and uh, alleviation. Now, which are some of the biggest uh, construction challenges that you're facing at this point? Um, well, you know, when you, when you build something like the Hyperloop, you need, first of all, secure the land. So that's always, the right of way is always the biggest challenge. Especially when it comes to doing something that's 300, 400 miles long, right? 600 kilometers. And especially in the Gulf Arab region, I mean the uh, Louvre in Abu Dhabi, for example, faced the same problem that you're building on sand and the soil is not very stable. Yeah, it's, um, you know, those things can be solved. It's not, it's, I mean, that's not a big, a big, a big issue. At the end, those problems are not that big because those are problems that you, fa that you already have every single day when you're building a freeway, uh, when you're building train, a, a train section, when you're building, as you say, a big building, right? So, so there's a lot of engineering challenges, there's a lot of uh, land acquisition challenges that you need to overcome. From a construction point of view, the system is actually very simple. It's, uh, it's basically, it's a tube on pylons or on the ground or you even tunnel and put it underground. And uh, you have vacuum pumps along the tracks that are every 10 kilometers that take the air out. And the train goes inside on a track, so the capsule, right? And moves uh, depending on the route alignment uh, up to just below the speed of sound. Now, Elon Musk actually talking about sound uh, recently tweeted that these pods could uh, reach half the speed of sound and come to a full stop within just 1.2 kilometers? That's just crazy. Is that not just too fast as well? 
well, it's definitely too fast for you and me to sit inside, right? So he's actually referring to a test that they're doing on the SpaceX track, which is the one that they're using for the SpaceX competition. Uh, and uh, there's not a lot of space, so you need to accelerate much faster than you would do normally. And um, of course, you have to brake really fast as well. It's, um, I, say, I would say it's more about showing that you can rather than necessarily something that really has to do with a, the with a system. Because at the end, acceleration needs to be something very gentle and soft, uh, needs to be something that works for a two-year-old as much as for an 80-year-old, right? Not only for people that want to have a thrill. So you don't feel speed, you only feel acceleration, deceleration. So it's really more optimized for comfort. You mentioned that the uh, testing center is based in Toulouse, uh, France, and uh, this is also where you're going to assemble and produce some of uh, the parts. Um, how far is this you know, manufacturing process there going, and are you planning to produce and manufacture everything from there because you already have a kind of aviation infrastructure there in Toulouse? So what we actually do is we use a completely new model, I would say. We rely heavily on partners. We don't necessarily produce anything. Um, Kaburas is manufacturing the capsule, and then, of course, to integrate it into the system, that's go what's going to happen in Toulouse. You need to adjust and bring everything together. Toulouse is an R&D center that allows us to work with our partners, that allows us to work with research partners, maybe other Hyperloop companies that want to test out new technologies. You just need a full-scale system somewhere where you can also test new um, construction methods, new materials, right? So that's what Toulouse is about. It's an R&D center for everything from, I would say, version number two to version number 220. Version number one is ready, and um, that's being built, and that's also what's being going to be built at the first commercial track. Your budget and financials are not so transparent. In 2016, uh, you mentioned that you were able to raise about 100 million US dollars from individuals as well as uh, groups uh, of investors. What does your budget look like at this point? Uh, do you need another uh, round of capital uh, fund raising? So um, we work in a little bit different way. As, as I mentioned earlier, we're using a completely new methodology. So our burn rates are very, very low. Um, we rely heavily on uh, our team members, heavily on our partners. So all of these companies are investing in kind services. They're bringing their knowledge, their IP into the company and are receiving um, participation in the company. Uh, in terms of just cash, uh, we have raised to date roughly $33 million and um, still plenty of it is there. We really just use our cash to actually build systems where we don't need it for research, which is great. Um, so you're still on solid ground uh, for the next uh, three to five years? Well, there's going to be other, you know, uh, investment opportunities. And of course, as we're moving forward, um, when we start building the different, the different projects, those are going to be financed, of course. But uh, I, I'm not sure that I can really legally answer your question about uh, ongoing fundraising. Now, would Hyperloop also work in a country like Switzerland, where you have a small landmass, high mountains and a lot of lakes? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, of, the challenges are a little bit different, right? You, um, when you have mountains, you might need to tunnel a little bit more. So um, to be honest with you, you need to do a feasibility study. But I would, uh, I would say you can probably use a lot of the infrastructure that's already there. Um, again. Hyperloop has two main advantages. On one hand, it's about the economical viability, so it makes economical sense. And on the other side, it's a speed. So the economical sense is always there. Um, it's uh, cheaper to operate than uh, a railway or a subway. So, and then if, and that's a big question here, you know, if based on the terrain, you can have uh, a lot of straight lines, you're even able to get up to high speeds. After the break, the idea of a Hyperloop was originally dreamed up by Elon Musk. Now, Richard Brunson's Virgin Group has entered the game too. Stay tuned to hear what our newsmaker today has to say about competitors. Welcome back. Could it really one day be possible to travel from St. Gallen to Geneva in less than one hour? Being able to travel faster and more easily is the vision of Dirk 
Alborn, who's the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. In the second part of our Newsmaker interview, Alborn tells us how he faces competition from other companies such as Richard Branson's Virgin Group. He also tells us how his Hyperloop could work here in Switzerland. Dirk, we are here in St. Gallen. Uh, this is in the very eastern part of Switzerland. Going from here by train to Geneva on the western side of Switzerland, it takes you about four hours. How long would this take on a Hyperloop? So it really depends on how the route would look like. If, uh, of course, if you go very straight, it's uh, 1,200 kilometers an hour. Um, so you would be there within, you know, a very short time frame, but very likely you will have to slow down with the mountains, you will have to tunnel a little bit, so it's going to take a little bit longer. But still, it's, uh, I would say, you're way below the hour. And the Hyperloop uh, system, how environment-friendly is it? So the whole system is actually completely green. It's, um, we use alternative energy, so we use solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and in some climates, even geothermal, to produce, depending on the route, of course, even more energy than we use. So basically we use the same right of way to, um, to have solar panels on top of the track, to have wind generation of power. It's, um, it really allows us to have a little bit lower operational cost, but that depends always on where you're building. It's a completely electric, so you don't really have any emissions. And we're even looking, when we're looking into the construction materials that we're using to try to be as sustainable as possible. And how convinced are you that this will revolutionize the way we commute and transport goods, that this is, you know, the future of transportation? So it's not only the Hyperloop itself, but it's about how you integrate it into existing systems, how it uh, connects to um, the other modes of transportation. Could it be easily connected, let's say, to the uh, Swiss Federal Railways, the SBB, for example, or would we need a total technological shift and uh, adapt to all these uh, systems? So we are a technology company and we would license our technology to SBB, for example. Um, they then would build Hyperloops. It's not our goal to build Hyperloops everywhere. It's more uh, working with partners together to bring the Hyperloop to market. So um, in, um, you cannot use... I mean, of course, you have to build a, a, a new infrastructure, right? Because you have to have the tubes. But you can use the same right of ways as long as they are fairly straight, which uh, in many, in many, in many cases is a case. So, um, but it's more important than that. It's that we need to look into first, first and last mile issues and connecting and creating a better passenger experience, right? If I think that today, if you think about how we travel. Um, it's terrible. Nobody really enjoys traveling anymore. We're in 2018. We have the chance to build the transportation systems the way you would do in 2018. And we do so, so by using technology and innovation. We're building a better system, a better passenger experience, something that's not based on classes, for example, something that uses the time better. Um, in our vision, the Hyperloop might not even cost anything because the business model of the ticket is something that is, you know, very old. It's something that might not make sense today anymore. You can create much more money and um, you can make more money with completely different, a different value chain. If you are monetizing on the time that the passenger spends inside the train, inside the airplane, inside the car, inside the Hyperloop, now you have a completely new opportunity and also a much better passenger experience. Talking about prices, have you talked about, uh, you know, ticket prices and uh, done any math already? Yeah, of course, we have done several um, feasibility studies. So with, how much uh, would a Hyperloop ticket cost? Well, it always depends on the route. Um, the capex is actually very low, so we have very low operational costs. Um, all of the feasibility studies that we have done show a return of investment between 8 to 12 years. And um, they all have been done comparing it basically to bus tickets. So um, That's incredibly you know, cheap. Well, that's a big advantage of the Hyperloop. You're moving inside a low-pressure environment. Creating or maintaining, more maintaining the, this low-pressure environment costs us 25 kilowatt hour on over 10 kilometers, which is roughly $3 in America. So it's very low to maintain the vacuum. And then you're moving the train inside. You're, the energy costs are very, very low. It's completely operated uh, by a computer system with human supervision. So 
it just makes more economical sense. There are so many advantages, be it ticket pricing or the environmental uh, friendliness or, you know, the um, kind of rollout uh, opportunities. Why are not more investors and governments jumping on this project? Well, actually, there are plenty. There are plenty of governments that want to talk to us. There are plenty of investors that are talking to us, of course. Um, but how serious are they? No, I think they're fairly serious. You know, um, it's... It's, it's, it just takes some time. I mean, you need to have the regulation. So it's really difficult when you sit down with the Minister of Transportation, for example. They would love to build, but of course, it's not at that point yet, right? So you just need to get to that point. So Abu Dhabi is a very important step to have the first commercial line to create the regulatory framework, to work with Munich Re, our insurance partner, to create this insurance concept. All of these things are important to move it over into commercial state. And that's a big hurdle. The technology has been around for quite some time. That's not the issue. It was more about integrating, bringing them all together. Um, in order to commercialize it now, you need to work with the governments. And luckily, you know, we work with several governments around the world. They're very supportive. I've met personally with many of the leaders of the world. Angela and, uh, Merkel, for example, as well. Vladimir Putin. Yes, um, uh, and he is very supportive, for example. Erdogan, when we ask uh, for support, we ask for support in the regulation. And, of course, we're in the Emirates and uh, we're working with the royal family. We have... And Sheikh Mohammed is very... Um, a big visionary. Yeah, and, um, you know, we're in Abu Dhabi, so we're working with Sheikh Al Nayan. Um, Sheikh Fala bin Zayed Al Nayan is actually part of our company. He's our official partner and sponsor in the Emirates. He's a brother of the ruler of the Emirates. And, um, you know, it's definitely the right region to do these things. There have been a, a number of uh, fatal accidents uh, when it comes to self-driving vehicles. Hyperloop uh, will also be driverless. And how safe is this technology? So the technology of uh, a train that's without a driver has been around for quite some time. And, um, you know, it's much, much simpler than a car. A car is in a free environment, things are changing, things are moving around. We're inside a tube. We're inside a tube that's um, in a low pressure, so there's nobody inside. Um, it's much easier to make that uh, safe, of course. Now, Hyperloop transportation technology is not the only player when it comes to Hyperloops. Uh, Richard Branson of Virgin has also started to develop the uh, Virgin Hyperloop uh, One. Now, what about this competition for the Hyperloops? Uh, who is faster than the other? I don't know if it's really about being faster. I mean, Richard Branson joined Hyperloop One. Hyperloop One was a company that uh, um, started two years after us. And, Has he actually uh, copied your technology and your concept? No, no, no. I mean, we work in a very unique way. And uh, Hyperloop One started out roughly two years after us. Um, they raised a lot of money. They're working in a very traditional way. I think that uh, it's not so much about a competition. We're all going into the same direction. But we he all... wants his Hyperloop One to be up and running in just three years' time. So he would be basically winning the race. I don't, again, I don't think it's a race because everything is, um, you know, everybody is working in the same direction. I personally, based on what's out there, we work with right now much more governments around the world. We're we have been working with our insurance company. Where we are ready to build pro full time, uh, pro uh, sorry, full size prototype. Um, we are now doing our R and D center in uh, in, to in Toulouse. We're doing the first commercial line. So for now, we might be a little bit ahead, but I think the companies are, you know, all of them are moving in a great direction, and uh, hopefully, there's a way to all work together at one point, because that's really what's needed. We're not really competing against each other. I mean, maybe you are competing when you're, comp when you're talking to an investor, but many investors actually also like to invest in both companies. Um, what you're really competing against is the status quo, right? What's out there. And um, so for us, it's important that they are successful. And the worst thing that can happen to us is that they fail. And I think it's the same, same thing on the other hand. So, you know, I, um, I always say that we, you know, we are celebrating their wins as well. I think that's important.
It's one community. Now, sky seems to be no longer the limit. Uh, Virgin Galactic, for example, uh, looks at space travel as well, has launched uh, the new spacecraft Unity. Elon Musk has his uh, aerospace company SpaceX. How will we commute in a decade, in a century from now, Dirk, if you look uh, through a crystal ball? Well, I think it's, I, I hope it's going to be much more comfortable than what it is today. Um, you know, we have a very large effort um, where it's about passenger experience. We work with several partners on creating something that hasn't really been done so far by using our time a little bit better, um, seeing um, traveling more as an opportunity to do things and um, even monetize on them and have experiences. I think that's the most important part at the end. How you're being moved is not as important. Hopefully, we don't have to move that much anymore, right? Maybe we can do this virtually and uh, it works just fine. You are such a chat-setter. I'm sure that you would like to uh, travel more conveniently and also a bit less, uh, be based uh, more at, at home maybe too. Now, Elon Musk, for example, has, uh, you know, the uh, SpaceX lunar tourism mission going on and it's all about uh, the talk of space uh, tourism, space travel as well. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, I think we need to push our boundaries, right? So uh, I think that's important. Um, he wants to go to Mars. I don't. <laughs> Would you like to spend your holiday out in space at some point or are you more grounded? Well, I think, I mean, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely an experience and um, I'm, up, I'm someone that's up for experiences. I wouldn't want to go somewhere that I can't come back. I think there's plenty of things to do here on Earth and things that we need and should do better. Um, so, you know, I'm not interested in a one-way ticket to Mars. Um, so in my lifetime, I don't think it's going to be possible to go there and come back. Um, but again, I think it's about pushing boundaries, um, creating a better world, creating maybe a, a new world. So um, yeah, I mean, that's really what more people should be doing. And I'm hoping that gravity will uh, keep you on this planet and grounded as well. Thank you so much for your time, Dirk. Thank you. Coming up, French company Saint-Gobain has dropped its bid for control of Swiss rival Sika. We'll have more reaction and analysis next. Big news today, a new deal announced between Sika and French company Saint-Gobain, ending a long and bitter takeover battle. Earlier, senior reporter Andreas Schaffner talked to Sika chairman Paul Hulg. Hulg was opposed to the deal from the very start more than three years ago. It was quite busy, quite stressful, especially in the beginning uh, when the transaction was announced, or the planned transaction, uh, better said. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, over the whole three and a half years we could stay together as a board and uh, that today we could announce the solution to this uh, long story. At the end, what really made people change their mind to have this solution? I think there are two things. One is that the value of the Sika store, uh, stock is now above the value of the contract uh, price, is one point. And the second is the timing. Uh, it became um, clear that uh, before the contract between family and uh, Saint-Gobain ends, there will not be uh, a decision, a final decision of the federal court. And I think those two points brought uh, the other parties to the table. What about the possible defeat in front of court? Was it also an argument? Uh, no, the, the, I think it's clear that the court decision uh, wouldn't matter anymore uh, because there is never, it will not be a final decision within the contract period. So uh, that's, uh, that's not relevant. So who made the first step then? Uh, it was from uh, Sangoma where we were uh, contacted. We always had uh, contacts uh, before, but uh, it became then uh, uh, more intense uh, after the uh, General Assembly. 
What about the one share, one vote decision? This is something which a lot of companies still don't have in Switzerland. Will you be a role model for them? Uh, we don't particularly want to be a role model. We want to introduce a modern uh, governance uh, structure. Uh, we, we did fight uh, for, uh, for this uh, in the interest of SICA and of all uh, shareholders. And at the next uh, EGM, we will introduce one share, one vote. We will eliminate the opting out. Uh, we will eliminate the voting right uh, restrictions. And we will also split the stock uh, by a factor of 60 to make it more uh, tradable all in the interest uh, of our shareholders. The stock price went up pretty clearly today at Sika, but also at Sangoba. What's your explanation? Uh, you know, it was always a lot of uncertainty uh, uh, on our stock on, on uh, Sika uh, because there was no uh, resolution to this transaction. It was not clear where it would end. And uh, I'm pleased that the market uh, supports us uh, in our decision. and. Uh, as uh, a board member, uh, I think I can speak for all board members, we are very pleased with, with the outcome of the negotiations and with this transaction. We could achieve all the targets we always uh, wanted and uh, obviously it's now good that the market does see it the same way. What about going on and looking in the future? You have two years maybe which uh, Sangobain wouldn't, wouldn't sell their shares. Is it a bit of uncertainty still ahead? Uh, no, the contracts control uh, very much what um, Sangoban can do and, uh, and limit them uh, in what they can add as participation in Zika and also they have always to contact, contact us first uh, in case they want to sell. Uh, so it's a pure financial investment uh, for them and uh, I could well see that uh, after the two years lockup uh, we would start to discuss what to do with the 10%. What about Sangoba having a, a member of the board also on their side? Is this a discussion? Uh, it was a discussion, but that's uh, absolutely excluded. Uh, and uh, because Sangoba and Zika, we are competitors, and uh, it cannot be that the competitor has a seat in our board, and that was accepted by Sangoba. This was at the beginning also your argument to uh, be against this deal, wasn't it? Exactly, and it's finally recognized by Sangobar that they are a competitor. What about your salary? You didn't get any salary being a chairman of the board in the last few years. Will this happen now? Uh, we have on every uh, General Assembly, we have the agenda point uh, compensation. We'll put it then again on the next uh, uh, extraordinary General Assembly. There is no reason now uh, to vote against, uh, family did vote against, uh, to tire us out and, uh, and there is no reason anymore for that, so I'm convinced we will get the salaries accepted. Despite the recent return of market volatility, earnings season has been golden for nearly all companies. Even those tech stocks, after a brief fall from grace, have enjoyed a bounce after stellar earnings reports. Earlier I spoke to Dan Scott about where investors should look to for solid investing in the coming months. I think the, the one major takeaway, the big headline, if I had to you know, say it in one or two words, would be best earnings season ever. Oh, wow. That's it, a bold statement. It's, um, so does that mean we should be sticking with those as stocks? I mean, we're seeing good employment, inflation, better wages perhaps in the US. So stick to stocks? Well, in fact, yes. Um, it, although getting specific about the selection is increasingly important. So in general, we had about an 80% beat in the first quarter. Pretty much all of the S&P 500 have reported. Most of the companies in Switzerland also have reported. The beats for the first quarter were strong. Um, when you take a look at the outlook, you can see, though, that some of the companies are now talking about a bit of a rolling over or a slowing down in the growth um, outlook for the rest of the year. And I think that's where the volatility started to set in. You saw it for consumer staples. Some of them were talking about input costs rising. And at the same time, they weren't able to pass on that rising input cost to consumers. So consumer staples didn't perform very well, even though the numbers were good. Industrials also, we had some wobbles in the industrial sectors. Companies like Caterpillar talking about potentially that was it, that was as good as it gets. Um, and the share is selling off on the back of that. When it comes to emerging markets, though, we're seeing a lot of outflows. So does that mm. mean invest in developed markets? Well, I mean, on the emerging markets situation, we think no. We think that the outflows that we saw in emerging markets purely were because we had a short period 
um, where we thought inflation was picking up a little bit, yields rose about 3%, and you basically had money being sucked out of emerging markets and parked back again in the US because long-term yields in the US were back above 3%. We maintain our overweight emerging markets because we think structurally they're stronger, demand is strong, the earnings outlook is better, companies are less indebted in emerging markets. So we take that volatility um, on boards and we enjoy the extra yield that you get from emerging market corporate debt. Okay, being a bit of a contrarian there. Now, those yields that you mentioned, they're not... Uh doing any damage to equities at the moment? No, I think at these levels, not. I mean, if we head much above 3%, then, then yes, uh, there will have to be some, some rotation. But we don't necessarily see much potential beyond 3% in, uh, in US Treasuries. So from that perspective, um, we think that equities really still are far more attractive than bonds. And of course, much of all of this does stem from uh, dollar strengths. Uh, has it taken a pause for a while? What's your assessment there? Yeah, I mean, we structurally, we're negative on the dollar. So we think that it has longer term. It's on its way down. And what happened now was just a bit of a recovery. It was technically, on a short-term basis, it was oversold. We had a bit of a spike higher, helped by geopolitical political risks um, and other factors, but, uh, but now you see that it's, that's already unwinding again and the dollar is back to its declining trends. So we definitely are sticking with emerging markets and think investors have much more opportunity there. Now, I'll come to the wider problem of the US sanctions on Iran in just a moment, but Russia is threatening to dump US dollars in favour of euros. Is this going to be a, a trend we see globally, do you think? I, I mean, I think increasingly there are more countries that are putting on a fight with the US in the trade negotiations debates by saying, we're not going to use your currency as a reserve currency. So that's an option that's open to China when they're arguing with the US that they're no longer going to trade in US dollars with their international counterparts. Or for the Iranians to say, well, I don't need to sell your oil in, or our oil in US dollars. We can sell it in blockchain or we can sell it in uh, Chinese yuan. Um, and these are ways, of course, that, um, that they go into the negotiations with the US. But this could be a huge destabilizing movement, couldn't it? I think probably not, because um, it, it still represents Chinese yuan and, uh, of course, the Iranian uh, currency represent very small amounts. Uh, um, if, to, to move to the euro, perhaps, but short to medium term, we don't really see the US dollar being destabilized as the global currency. Okay, so let's talk about this U-turn. Yeah. Uh, uh, Trump has... Uh, is imposing, reimposing sanctions on Iran. And mm -hmm. uh, now the markets seem to be ready for that. Would you say that's fair? They barely wobbled. It's true. Yeah, they barely wobbled. We're lucky um, because it could have gone another way. I think the big, uh, the big part of it was the reaction of Iran itself to say that they are actually staying in the agreement. They first want to meet with their European counterparts, Russia and China, um, before that they, you know, move forward and make any decisions. And so it really depends on the rest of the countries within that initial agreement, um, whether it gets unraveled or not. Um, and, and of course, the one potential area that still could flare up in this situation is Israel and how they um, chime in with this current situation. Um, but, uh, but the way things have unraveled so far, it seems like we have a peaceful so resolution. So markets absorbed it fairly well, but when it comes to oil prices, mm -hmm. It really took centre stage there, I suppose. Uh, longer term, do you see any supply risks? So we think Iran is a sentiment driver for oil. It doesn't really have any impact on the real underlying fundamentals. We're talking about maybe 200,000 barrels a day of production that would be uh, sapped out of the markets. We're not really talking about big movers to the fundamentals. The fundamentals driving the oil price at the moment are the fact that big oil majors have underinvested over the past five years, so there's not enough production to meet the current demand out of emerging markets predominantly, which remains strong. So demand for oil continues to rise every year, one to two percent, but production isn't keeping up. Are you of the camp then that uh, barrels will be $100 a hundred dollars? So we're definitely not that high up, but we think that they're supported around the current price level. We think that if oil prices go too high up too quickly, what you're going to get is a response from shale and from other areas that can quickly turn on reserves. Shale is very quick. They can overnight increase their production if the price is right. Uh, deep sea is very different. Deep sea takes six years from investment decision to actual production. So um, deep sea, which is the biggest amount, we're talking about 70% of the total production, um, that is slow. But shale, which represents about 15% of production, is fast and it can respond. Just maybe one last word on volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, trade wars, 
what, what are your expectations over the next weeks and months? Well, so we actually think the volatility, volatility right now and it's come back to low levels again is too low and it likely will pick up again like we saw at other parts in the first quarter. So volatility, we think, is, should be back to normalized levels like we saw in the first quarter um, and, um, or, or over the first quarter. And that's why we think that active management and selection is very important at this point. Dan Scott talking to me a little earlier there. Now, as we head into a beautiful weekend, let's end the week on a lighter note because US President Donald Trump apparently has a signature you just can't miss. CNN's Jean Mousse dug up some science about what his handwriting says about him. That's a big one. Not just big, it's enormous. It's colossal. It's huge. Marking his territory. When it comes to President Trump's signature, even oldsters won't be needing their reading glasses. Why? Why is his signature so big, someone tweeted. Author J.K. Rowling responded, I didn't believe in graphology until about three minutes ago. She linked to a site analyzing what large handwriting means. An independent handwriting expert confirmed. The size of the signature correlates with narcissism, with ego, with a grandiose sense of self-importance. The size alone equals, I'm so important, I don't need to uh, obey margins, I can just scribble like I'm a movie star or a rock star. Or a president, or a best-selling author? Trump supporters dug up J.K. Rowling's signature. I guess you're no different then. You know, it's funny, because she is throwing stones about Donald Trump, but she also has really big signature, which I think is a success trait. That goes for both of them, but graphologist Bart Baggett says rolling exhibits a fluid feminine flow, while President Trump's signature looks like a hacksaw. His sharp, angular, scissor-like M's and N's. Which basically is a lack of compassion. Tweeted one critic, it looks like the result from a polygraph. He's lying, of course. A polygraph, a seismograph. Since we're comparing size, the handwriting expert's signature is no shrimp. Though perhaps not Trumpian. It's really the epitome of narcissism. Internet pranksters keep changing the president's signature. When it comes to certain presidents and authors, the writing's not just on the wall, it takes up the whole wall. And it can take big hands to sign a big signature. Genie Mo, CNN, yeah. New York. Time to increase the size of your signature. Well, that's it from us here on The Newsmaker and also The Swiss Polls. Don't forget you can watch us live on YouTube or catch up with all our content and interviews on cnnmoney.ch. I'm Amanda King. Thank you for watching. Have a very good night. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland Leisure Weather Report. Here's our Swiss webcam view of the day. Let's begin with the Outdoor Activity Comfort Index for the western part of Switzerland. And now for the eastern part. And on to the south of Switzerland. Now, let's have a look at the weather forecast for the north of Switzerland. And for the west. Let's take a look at the rain forecast for Europe. And here's a snapshot of the weather on the Mediterranean Sea. As well as the water temperatures. CNN Money Switzerland wishes you a great time outdoors.